where does more plates, more dates, the name come from? That's a secret. Do you think that I am natural? I can't imagine that personally. And yet you suck ass. Do you have any fancy cars or anything fancy? You have a Bugatti or are you a dork? With no money? Yeah, Hyundai Elantra. Fuck, that's cool, man. I don't really make money. I'm sure you're similar. At the club every single weekend, buying six bottles and yeah. like pouring it on my Rolex. You fucking loser. I'm going to get rich off of telling you how to get rich. You're very articulate. You're very well spoken. Bro, that's totally incorrect. I, uh, um, the, the dumb. You're an idiot. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Don't Be Sour, episode 31. I'm your host, Max Tuning, and we have a very special guest today, Mr. Derek. More plates, more dates. What's up, man? Not much. Thanks for hosting me, man. Appreciate it. What's your What's your last name? Something that is not going to be put in the video. <laughs> oh, you don't tell people your last <laughs> no, name? It's like an anonymous uh, privacy thing. Okay. I don't know. I don't <laughs> you know that sometimes the more times you're private, the more people are like, I'm going to figure all this shit out. Yeah. Yeah. It Just, is is. all right. We'll call him Derek Zoolander on the Potter, man. What's up, dude? Welcome. I, you're from Canada. I'm excited about this pod because I don't, while you're in the, I'd, I'd say you're mainly in the fitness space. I know you can touch on things outside of that, but uh, I, I don't know a lot about you because your realm of content creation and everything is, I guess, like different than the, you don't care about vloggers and stuff like, you know, you're not out there vlogging. No, not really. I've considered it and I've don't even do it. tried a couple of times, but it just isn't my, uh, I don't know, my comfort zone. Yeah. And even, I don't know, it just doesn't feel like a scalable video it's, it's style not, for me. It's, so you build an audience. Though, yeah. But, well, okay, well, man, well, you know, you're from Canada. I'm here. I'm ready to learn a lot about you. Tell the people, dude, who are you? What do you do? That's a really hard thing to summarize, but my Here's your, your Uber pitch, dude. I, just yeah. like if you like tell people like your what you do in life without, you know, going d deep dive, like what's your what's your surface level? Like, what do you identify as to the random person who wants to know what you do? Right. So typically I would say I you know, make social media content centered around things to do with hormones, endocrinology, biology, pharmacology, and it's stuff that I was just highly interested in when I was younger and it kind of led me down rabbit holes of further educating myself and then making content surrounding stuff I felt like might be useful information to impart on others who are seeking the same kind of um, further education. And um, it kind of led me to creating blogs. So I used to write articles on my website and that's kind of how moreplatesmoredates.com came to be. Yeah. It's kind of like a not, it still functions and it's a website, but I don't write like I used to because it's just, you know, you write an article and you could have otherwise filmed six videos. I, I think that time. I think people are still making blogs, but I, it's they're a, it's a yeah. dying, dying art form, I guess. No, it's wild because back in the day, that was the way to get your message out is write articles. Like Bodybuilding.com. Yeah, get stuff. it indexed on Google. We have the top search result for best pre-workout or, you know, how to, uh, I don't know, best bicep workout. Like, who knows? Just stuff like that. And um yeah, back then it was like, I don't know, five or six years ago, I used to write blog articles and I was encouraged to also film videos alongside those, mm -hmm. which was essentially just a video iteration of the exact same written content. And then it soon got to a point where I realized this is not going to be scalable or I can't get the information out at the frequency I want to even feel like I'm doing myself uh, justice when I'm also trying to write because you can make you know, grammatical errors when you're speaking yeah. that are otherwise looked over. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but when you're writing, you have to metic meticulously proofread everything. And it's just to write a, a paragraph that you could otherwise say in two seconds, it just takes, you know, five times longer. I, I so. like how you, you bring up like the grammatical side of things, which is interesting because I think people like look for the relatable person who does, you know, can stumble themselves. It's like when you see like Elon Musk speak, yeah. Like at a, he's like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and it's like, Hey, I talk like that. Yeah. You know, you kind of, it's kind of like, I don't say it brings people down, but it may, like makes them real rather than this, like, you know, people who are just like perfect and never make a mistake. And you know, they, Elon's like one of us, you know, same yeah. bank account size and everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you said, you said you wrote articles way back when you're what? 30. Yeah. It sucks. Right. Yeah. It's not great. I'm 33. Oh, uh, rough. I know, I know, I know. Falling apart, bro. And you're doing like all of these, uh, you're doing like, you're on like a podcast tour right now. Yeah, yeah. Like 
typically if I'm going to go to the States for something, I try to get the most bang for my buck, so to speak, of leaving the country. So Mm -hmm. if there are outstanding requests to go on podcasts or people I've, uh, you know, spoken with that want to collaborate, um, then it just makes sense to knock them all out in a string rather than go back and forth country to country over and over again. You can hit up Chick-fil-A and all the yeah. great things that, you know, unfortunately Canada doesn't have. Yeah. There are a lot of places that, uh, we don't have that are pretty good. I went to, uh, keepers, I think it's called for sushi with oh. J- James English yesterday. Yeah. I was there like a couple of days ago. Yeah. That's, that's actually the best sushi place in this area. Very good. Uh, right. Yeah. It was really good. Yeah. Well, where in Canada do you live? Vancouver. Is that the so West coast? West coast. Is that like the French side? Like the very left of the map. Okay. Yeah. I thought that, I thought when you get left, it's more French. Oh, oh no, that's uh, more Quebec. That's Quebec. Yeah, Where's that's Quebec? On the east side. What? Yeah. I thought Toronto's east, Quebec's left. I'm just messed up, dude. Yeah. Okay. See, this is going to be, this is a prime example. That's a good, a good example of this podcast because I'm, I'm, you know, I, you go on a lot of shows and I've, I've watched a lot of your, your content recently, especially prepping for the podcast to kind of learn some more about you. You're very, uh, very smart dude, man. You're very articulate. You're very well spoken. You know what you're talking about because I know you know a lot of your specific uh, things you do are you know breaking down you know not in a bad way breaking down people what maybe what they do in the in the fitness space supplements all that and you you know what you talk about. I think people look at you as a like well informed source of information or a well informed source of uh, your opinion. They respect a lot of that. So I need to make sure my questions are not low level. You need to be high. <laughs> You know, yeah. well, I, I hope I wouldn't come across as like unrelatable in that. I only have, you know, pretentious topics. To talk no, about no, no, no. I, 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 it's just like if you were to compare my type of content and the way I speak and the way I come across. I'm a like, bro, dude. You've seen are, you think you're bro. I think so. You're a well-spoken bro. Yeah. You're like scientifically it's destroying the bro scientist, bro. You're the bro scientist. Yeah. Where does where does more plates, more dates the name come from? So when I started the blog, I was very much looking at brands in the self-improvement. What like year was this? When was this? 2016. Okay. Yeah. So I was very much looking to who exists in the online, I don't know, just online in general that does male self-improvement related stuff. And you had like Alpha M, I think teaching men's fashion maybe, but that was more YouTube. And then I was looking at blogs and there was guys like, uh, one of my close friends, he had goodlookingloser.com. There was a uh, danger in play. There was uh bold and determined. It was, I don't know these. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't expect anyone knows now what those are, but those were popular blogs back in the day for men's self-improvement. Just generally, um, not just, you know, hormone side of things or performance enhancement or anything, but just, you know, communication skills, building relationships, dressing better, getting in shape hygiene, you know, basic stuff like that. And I would look to those kind of examples as what did they call themselves and why? And was it catchy? It stuck, whatever. Mm. Like there was this kind of uh, um, nudge towards having something that sounded memorable, I guess. And for me, I had like an array of different, you know, names that I thought at the time. And for me, more plates, more dates. I was like, huh, this sort of rolls is, off the tongue. It, it rhymes. It's overarchingly sort of covering working out fitness, but also sort of talks about lifestyle a little bit. Like it's not meant to be have a douchey connotation, although it may come across that way, which is unfortunate as I get older because I, you know, don't feel I align with that necessarily, yeah. especially as I get older, it's, you know, more and more disconnecting. But, you know, back then it was like, oh, this is catchy. You know, the blog URL has not been taken surprisingly, even though it sounds like a pretty, I would have thought it would have been snagged up by now. And what was, here it is. What was the, you said you had some other names. What was, what, what, really what, bad ones, dude. I don't even remember. You got to have, what, what's one other one you thought of? Is it another like rhymey thing? Um, probably. Um. <laughs> more biceps, more eyes checks. <laughs> I, I don't remember what they were, but it was, uh, I don't know. I would have to pull up an email from 2016 to see my uh, breakdown. More plates, more dates it is. Yeah. And you said 2016 you started writing blogs. Why didn't you just, because I, you know, I, I started YouTube in 2013. So, I mean, it had already been kind of started. Why were you still like, I'm going to go with the written version of things rather than just putting yourself out on the interwebs on the YouTubes? Well, at that time, I was only familiar with blogs. I did not really follow YouTube that closely. Like, I was familiar with, 
I th- your stuff, Christian stuff, some of the, you know, OG fitness guys. You know me from a while back? Yeah. What? Yeah. Nice. Wild, okay. right? I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> Um, but, um, but yeah, at the time it just, I don't know, like there's certain things that now might seem obvious, but back then just didn't even occur to you as a logical step. So I remember I asked, um, somebody who I respected who had one of those blogs that I was looking to for, you know, inspiration on the name. I was like, what do you think about YouTube or making videos? He was like, do it hundred percent. You should be doing videos alongside the written content. Why would you not? Similar reasons why, you know, like a Gary V might say you should be publishing everywhere. Why would you not? 70 pieces of content a day. It was wild. He actually DM'd me this morning. What? He was like, keep crushing it, Derek. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, life made, bro. There you yeah. go. Yeah. But um, anyway, so I wrote these articles for maybe a month and then um, sort of just repur- not repurposed it. I was basically just reading off of a script because it was just my article that I wrote and it was very obvious I was reading off my screen. And then after a while, I got more comfortable on camera, started just going off the cuff. And then eventually it just turned into, oh, the blog it doesn't really get even nearly the same amount of views that a video would get. So what's the point of investing 10 hours into a written article that otherwise you could yeah. get done in, you know, 30 minutes or something. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. were you working like a day job at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, a bouncer at the time and then you are uh, pretty jacked, man. <laughs> not as much as I used to, but you know, doing, I, doing what I can. You ever mountain. had to like, just really just like punch someone or just actually bounce them? Like, Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's, I don't know, a wild gig. Here's the question. Sure. If you're a bouncer, what do you do if the person who's causing problems bigger than you? Well, that's where you have other bouncers to help you. Yeah. Mm. And there's just like a general sense of respect you should have for the establishment you're in. If you're being a, yeah, but I guess if you're getting kicked out, you're probably drunk, intoxicated. And then you're not like, yeah, yeah, no, it, yeah I, cases, I completely understand, dude. I'm going to get out of here, man. It's usually, what the fuck, bro? I, yeah. I wasn't called the problems. I see all the videos of p- people don't get nicely bounced out or they're not like. That's like the worst case scenario. Sometimes they'll, you know, argue with you, but they will, you know, sort of oblige. But then sometimes you have to just straight up carry them out. I feel like it's the u- ultimate like chest pump man thing to, to be like a, a bouncer and then to get rid of someone like, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, other guy who's trying to be this like alpha male in here. You're gone. It's definitely a weird dynamic where the only place it's socially accepted to pick a guy up and throw him onto a curb. Outside. Yeah. 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 You see all these videos and every single time it's like, he had to come in, he had to come in or like, you know, they shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that. And no, no one ever like questions like a bouncer kicking someone out or kind of getting rough with someone. No. Yeah. Yeah. Even, uh, yeah. Just going up to somebody and fireman carrying them outside. Never see that anywhere else. Typically. Do you still firemen carry grown men out? No, no. But let that life behind you. So you, you did the bouncing thing for a while. And then when, when did you, that's going to make it into the intro for sure. <laughs> you never know, dude. Every time you, you be, make sure be careful what you say throughout this podcast. Yeah. It's going to get chopped up. Heavily. <laughs> uh, so you did the bouncing for a while and then you just left that and flapped your wings onto the tubes. Yeah. So I was trying to make my way into accounting of all things. It was uh, something that I just felt was a segue from my business degree. I had gotten at the time. Bouncing to accounting makes sense. Yeah. So once I finished my undergrad, I wanted to go work downtown at some company and be an accountant or whatever seemed to be a good living for somebody with a business degree. And then uh, I started writing online and sort of picked up traction on that. And, you know, it sort of just transitioned from there. It made no sense to go that route anymore when I was actually doing what I liked because I didn't like accounting. How, how many years were you, how many years were you like starting this path of blogs, YouTube, whatever, until you took the leap into full-time? Uh, maybe like a month. Shit. Yeah. Oh, damn. I, man, I, I, I was, mine was like a three-year journey. You're, you must've, yeah. w- what a month in, like, what was the, well, for me, it was sort of imposed on myself because I got injured actually bouncing. So for me, I was kind of just at home doing nothing while I was healing. And uh, then I was just sitting there. I was like, what can I do? I started writing articles. And then as I started to pick up traction on it, I'm like, huh, maybe I should just not go back to bouncing. Maybe I should just keep writing. Maybe I shouldn't go apply for those you know, corporate jobs. Maybe I should just keep writing and make videos. And I actually got hired or a job offer from one of my friends who was one of those people with those original blogs for the men's self-improvement stuff that I respected. He had a company and he asked if I would work for them and be, you know, their supplement formulator and do all their social media, write blog articles, et cetera. 
So I kind of got lucky in that I had a little bit of a, a connection through my expertise. I was sort of vetted into this job off the jump that isn't necessarily like a, a normal thing. Right. So I, I had a side income through that gig while I did my online stuff for my own brand at the same time. Did you, are you, do you like run this by your parents of like, Hey, I'm not going to go the, you know, I'm taking my business degree and kind of go into the corporate world of the norm of what people do and what your kind of parents probably, you know, grew up the, the kind of the, the standard of life, what most people do before. Um, and then you're like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to try out this fitness related thing. Were they all for it or hesitant? Yeah, I think they were hesitant, but they, I don't know. They didn't give me a ton of pushback on it either. I think they were just hyper, uh, very, very uh, skeptical that it was going to work out. Yeah, yeah I think that's all most parents are. And even when you start, it's not like you know it's going to work out. You're just, you know, I'm sure when you picked up a camera, you didn't have any idea it would turn into even a fraction of what it is now. So. No, and I think that's the difference of social media now versus maybe when you or I started, I started a little bit before you is we were just like creating content to create content. And then it's like money and stuff and, and stability and um, started becoming a byproduct of putting this content out where maybe now people see all that success and they just like, they need to have that one month in, it needs to take off for me or, yeah. you know, I'm going to kind of give up on it. So mine was, I was like doing shit for like two years before I really started. I mean, I was, I was making 500 bucks a month, 300 bucks a month from YouTube and social media, but I wasn't doing it. I, I just was like, this is just a hobby. And then it yeah. started turning into that. Yeah. I don't think anyone should expect to have an entrepreneurial blast off in year one or even year two. It's very much like a slow grind that then anybody who you see who's hyper successful, who hasn't had it silver platter to them or is like a trust fund kid or whatever, very much took years to get to where they are in general. Yeah. Maybe now you could have hyper accelerated growth by being like a TikTok. That damn TikTok, what. man. <laughs> Do you ever see that and think like, Fuck, if that was around when I started, like these kids have it so easy compared to my grind. It, 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 or do you think it's a good thing over? It's really time? like the old man yelling at a cloud yeah, complex of right? like, you know, I had to actually work <laughs> for my success. These damn kids. Yeah. I guess it's it, you do sense some sort of frustration because, you know, at the end of the day, on surface level, you look at they're just doing dumb dances for 10 seconds. That's not actual work. And they're blowing up and getting all these things. I had to do this for, you know, I had to do X, you're just yelling at a cloud. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, I think it's really just an acceptance of times they are a change in, you know, and it's like you either get with it or you just fight it. Do you sponsor any like dancing kids on TikTok or anything for your <laughs> candy or what do you, what's your business model like for scale? <laughs> you know, I have a very interesting, uh, of, for, for sour strips, our model is get sour strips into the hands of every single person who's anybody ever at scale on a, we, we send probably a hundred new influencers that could be athletes, rappers, you know, TikTok dancers, anyone like probably a hundred per week wow. for the past like three years, which is a shit ton of people. Yeah. And I'm not even like exaggerating. It's like 10 to 20 boxes a day to new people. And so we don't, we don't um, pay anyone for any sort of like post or anything. Uh, Cause I think with a food product, it's a little different. People aren't like, getting a bunch of candy sponsorships mm -hmm. on a regular basis. So they're more inclined to just like, yeah, sure. I'll take it. We don't ask for anything. We're like, we'll send it to you. They just usually happen to post and they usually want more. And then we're like, Hey, can you give us a tag? But we just flood the world with it, which is easier than maybe you can't send out hundreds and hundreds of tubs of pre-workout, for example, a week, you know, it's not probably the business model ours, you know, the cost of goods is a little cheaper and we can kind of do it at scale. But, um, TikTok has definitely changed the game for a lot of people. Yeah. But I refuse to, I just, it's still make, I hate Do you not app. have an account? No, I do. Okay. And I just posted on something on my story. You know, I put all this work into whether it be vlogs or whatever. And I, I posted at 3 a.m. I got back from a Christmas party. It's like eating like a chicken sandwich and like filming my girlfriend doing like a dance on her phone in the background. Mm -hmm. It's at like 750,000 views right now. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. and, and I'm like, just makes you want to smash your head against the table. I'm like, this is not like, this isn't worth a million views. It's weird. Cause even if I repurposed, what is a high quality piece of content on YouTube, it's like TikTok algorithm. I feel like knows oh, it's it. not for TikTok. Mm -hmm. It's like you slimy fuck. You're trying to put YouTube content on here. I know like go film an like, original video. Yeah. yeah. They want, they want like the shittier quality. They don't want the good camera, yeah. which is actually, I think an angle you do because your YouTube videos, the more plates, more dates empire you're building over here. We need to talk about your backdrop. I think that's a, <laughs> have you ever, you talked about this with anyone? 
Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. It's a wood. I'm going to put it on the screen. It, it's a wood background. And is that like an AC unit in the? That's a secret. <laughs> it, it's either a radio or an AC unit. Maybe. And now it, I think people, there's a, some people think it's a, a sauna interface to like turn it on versus off and like crank the heat up. I don't think you film your videos in a sauna. Is your you might get some heat for that. Explain explain your backdrop. Explain like your your setup because I I think it's a strategy. Oh, you do. I do. I, I have you been filming that for a long time since day one. See, I think there's I think with your rise of success, you keep it. I think it adds relatability, so it doesn't like your you don't uh, become like who different than who you were. And yeah. sometimes the less quality is like what people want. They don't want you to elevate to a yeah. studio with, you know, eight, 4k HD cameras, multiple angles, a setup, a screen you're reading off of. What's your angle on that? No, I think you're uh, pretty spot on. Yeah. In general, I see a lot of people transition to, they think it needs to be super high quality, the most ridiculous production value. And I don't know, I've definitely considered that route myself, but oftentimes I just think, you know, it's working for me Just keep it going. And I do think it adds a level of relatability and even if my content changes in different trajectories and I cover different topics that maybe the ogs might not otherwise like as much at least it's still me it's still kind of like the setting they're familiar with and i don't know it's just it's just worked so i haven't seen a need to change it yet but i've also never tried anything else so maybe i'm uh missing out so it wasn't like you tr you've tried some other setup and people were like hey i don't like this change and you went back you've just always Anytime I've gone on vacation or something and it's a different background, people half the comments are about the background, <laughs> but it's also because it's the first video in like 400 videos that it's a different background. Okay. And, and all of you, and all of your content is the, we'll call it talking head type of content. Basically. That's what they call it. You just sit and you, you talk to the, the camera. Um, and we briefly before this, you know, said you didn't get into the vlogs and you seem very pers or private about, you know, your last name and you know, some of your, your, your private life. Um, why don't you go the, the vlog route or, Hey guys, here's what I'm, here's the sandwich that I'm eating today. Cause that's what the people want, man. Yeah. I, I know you're breaking down science, but people want to know, does he eat turkey or ham? Yeah. I've, uh, cause I've tried the vlogging and it just, for me, the, the nuisance of having a camera with me and always trying to think about what part of my normal life can I turn on the camera and start talking. Mm -hmm. I just don't think I could live that way. Like when I go out to dinner and I'm with friends or whatever, or the other day I was in Austin with some guys that just did podcasts with, and in my head, I'm thinking, fuck, if I was a vlogger, you know, for sure, I would have to be, check it out. I'm here at yeah. this, uh, whatever, this Mexican place eating something, whatever. And this that's is exactly my videos right there. Yeah. <laughs> Here's but another fucking margarita. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, like me, I'm sure if I did it enough, I would get comfortable with it. And eventually I would become decent at it but to me it's not where my wheelhouse is it's not what i enjoy like even from day one even though i was super awkward doing it i still enjoyed the talking head videos more than trying to vlog so stick with what you know yeah i guess the only thing i would say is is while i think it's it does have its own some people may look at vlogs like we look at maybe tiktoks of like this isn't work this is ju uh, someone just showing stupid points of their day there's no value here rather than a, a topic. But I think, you know, value comes in any form, whether it be entertainment, watching someone do the woe on TikTok, you know, and, you know, whatever people get from where they're disconnecting. But I also think vlogs are some of the best way to uh, create a true like audience of people that care about you rather than just if I care about the topic that they're talking about. They're more like, what are they like anything this person talks about? I want to do. But I mean, your channel does extremely well. It's not like you have a an insane fluctuation of 500,000 views, 30,000 views of depending on who you talk about. It's very somewhat in the same realm. So I think people are very hooked on you and your persona and your personality and just like whatever he's going to talk about, I'm going to listen to because of him. It's not just the information. I hope so. Yeah, that would be the ideal scenario, not just like what, you know, trending topic is happening. Yeah. I don't know. Like, would you have any recommendations as a veteran YouTuber as to what I should I'm the last or? person you want to get tips from, man. You can just look at <laughs> my analytics. I'm the last person you want to get tips from. Uh, no, well, I think it's obviously it worked because <laughs> like you still crank out, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of views, like a hundred K I think in general. No, 
No, my, but my, still, it's like the people are. He's like ninety k, right? <laughs> no, like okay, eighty k on a bad video. I'm like, but it's like diehard views. It, it, they are. I, yeah. I I would say. And what's a diehard view relative to? Uh, I'm just watching you to be entertained. View. Yeah. Like how many pranksters? No one gives a fuck, and they have millions of people following them. Yeah, it definitely. I think a lot of people look at someone's success on social media dependent on their their metrics. And I'm sure you know that the metric doesn't equate to success. Like yes. I've seen massive, massive influencers suck yeah. at converting on mm-hmm. anything. Or like you see massive influencers like here's my here's whether it be like a merch or something, and they there's like a huge story came out. Some like influencer girl with like millions of followers sold like. 30 t-shirts or something, yeah. which, you know, again, it's like, you know, like you only people create content to sell something. But at the end of the day, if you want to turn it into something full time, you have to make a, a living somehow and creating that audience, uh, the people who care about you to hopefully, hopefully convert. It's not like I make content. So people buy my shit. I've been doing it long enough that people can know that I just really like making content. But, um, yeah, I think building an audience views do not equal success views equal. This person's popular on the internet. Yeah. But it does not always correlate, especially on TikTok. Like, I think the million views there correlates to. Oh, it's like a couple thousand of like, what, 50,000 maybe on YouTube or something. I would say even less than that. Like, Mm -hmm. makes this mindless content. You do it. I mean, you scroll for TikTok for 30 minutes or or six hours, depending on, you know, how much you're consuming. And if you were to like, hey, what was like, what did you just watch for 30 minutes? I have no idea. I just can just just keep scrolling. I don't know. Are you good at avoiding doing that or do you find yourself mindlessly scrolling while you're sitting on the toilet i go through phases right now i'm in kind of a scrolling when i'm doing like brushing my teeth i'll be scrolling but then i i go in like a it'll be three four months and i don't even open the app while you're brushing your teeth what else are you gonna do you stare at yourself while you brush teeth you're like fuck i'm good looking man i don't know that's uh (laughs) that's the that's the time to do it you're like i got nothing else to do i have to stand here for two minutes i can't work on my computer right tiktok TikTok. That's next level multitasking, bro. That is. I'm yeah. dude, I'm basically like the the next Gary V. I'm you think you're grinding? I'm 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 not just watching TikTok. Yeah. I'm I'm re- marketing research, mm. market research while brushing my teeth. That's what we tell ourselves when we waste our time. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And so with with like the, the the background of, you know, no vlogs or whatever, you've and the not changing your background, you know, you, I think you've had great success in everything that you've done. Do you um what type of like life do you live outside behind outside of that wall? Like, do you, do you have any fancy cars or anything fancy? You have a Bugatti or are you a dork with no money? <laughs> no, I, uh, I try to be relatively frugal, except when it comes you to got a watch on. No, I don't Dude, no Rolex. How people are going to know you're successful, bro. <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm not like huge on, like flexing or anything like in general it'll be um the most money i try to spend is on like travel like i want to experiences and yeah like i should travel more for actual experiences but i mean more so when i go on business trips and stuff i will you know go first class instead of economy because i just typically even when i'm sitting if i'm well you're a big dude man you need the room you're lats if i'm touching the person beside me the entire time it's just not that enjoyable of a flight so like that's where i would deem it worthwhile to you know splurge okay or having a i don't know a nicer hotel room or go out for nice meals and not have to worry about it like that's where i find the utility of having the you know independence of money sort of thing as opposed to buying absurd things do you have any fancy cars yeah i saw a video with like an orange car is that yours orange Oh, also the, the, the McLaren. That's I don't even know. Oh. Yeah, we did like a giveaway video where, and it was sort of a vlog style. I like went around and went to uh, customers' places and met them outside, chatted, chatted a bit, gave them free stuff. Oh, they and, said you were going to give away McLaren. <laughs> no, oh. <laughs> I wish. I wish I could do that. <laughs> yeah. No, but it, it's ironic because I said I don't, you know, I'm not that, I don't know, materialistic, but I did get a Huracan a couple of years ago. You still have it? Yeah. A lot. That's the one thing I would say that I went over the top on. What is that? What's your daily driver? Hyundai Elantra. <laughs> yeah. And so, I've had it since I was 16. Really? Yeah. Damn. Still cranking. So you like. So it's like in the parking lot. It's like Hyundai Elantra Lambo. People are like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> you, 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 you pull up to have some sort of meeting with someone. They don't, they don't respect you. Cause they're like, dude, who's this guy in his Hyundai over here? And you're like, I'll be right back. <laughs> pull up in my Huracan. 
And I, I, a lot of people, I don't have, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm like an SUV guy. I, I can't, especially, dude, how do you fit in like a freaking Lambo? Uh, yeah, you kind of have to it's fall more, in it. <laughs> yeah, it's not that fun to get in and out of it. But especially at red lights, having to like look down sucks when you're, huh? if you're taller in a Lambo, it's really the vision. Oh. Yeah, the area to see out the window. And I don't ride in a lot of Lambos, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure you. Have. I mean, Chris, Christian. I mean, but he like swaps them out every like time. I, I don't mm-hmm. like. I haven't spent a large amount of time in them, so I'm mm-hmm. I'm just assuming big guy, small car. Yeah, it's things. definitely not the most uh, conducive to comfort for sure. Most people, I think, who get like super sports cars or what I've I've seen is they. I guess you you get excited. Maybe you hit like a a, a milestone, or it's like a dream to have it, to be able to afford it, or just uh, you or you love cars. Um, does the wow, this is so sick. It's a Lambo effect. Like wear off at a certain period of time. Oh yeah, for sure. Or you still like walk out and you're like, fuck, that's cool, man. I still see it and appreciate its beauty for sure. But I, uh, it's not as much like the mind blowing childhood fantasy that you once had that seemed so like, it's very much the hedonic treadmill. I'm sure you've heard of that where you're, I don't even know what hedonic. Yeah. It's based on essentially what you become accustomed to whatever your current success level is becomes your new baseline. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. that is normal to you now. So for you, even if you're making millions off of your several businesses in gross revenue, whatever, not yeah. So that going down to some lesser amount of that because you had a bad year or you're falling off on social media and you deem it to be, you know, I used to do better. I got more views, whatever it is. Your baseline is whatever your highest level of success was that at least sustained itself for a reasonable amount of time. So when you drop under that, you perceive it as even if it's, a, if it's objectively still wildly successful, yeah. you feel like a piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. So the hedonic treadmill very much sets itself at this baseline that is so high once you get to a certain level of success. And then anything less than that, like you just feel it normal. Something that would have made you a 10 out of 10 before now makes you a 6 out of 10 or a 5 out of 10. And then to get above that, you need to have something even more stimulating or more absurd, which is problematic from a neurochemistry perspective but it's also what drives entrepreneurs that just keep going even when you're do you hear this vernacular dude neurochemistry yeah i don't know if i have the uh vocabulary of a 12 year old but it, like <laughs> no one on this podcast has used some of these words man so uh, just elevated right on your hedonic level of <laughs> speaking is yeah <laughs> the baseline is raised bro your yeah. baseline is raised mm. and you're, so your, your your content is um super interesting and, and i i say like i didn't know a lot about you because like your you know the, the type of videos you make is not like what i personally consume because i don't live in that like world of uh hardcore fitness like mm-hmm. it's more i'm like a casual fitness guy the relatable fitness guy not like trying to be top tier aspire to be the you know bodybuilder elite power lifter types things like that i bet you're exposed to more of it in person than i am though yeah it's just being here mm. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. Yeah. And with why did you decide to go down that route of like that type of content and like keep leaning into it? I mean, I know we don't, you didn't want to do the vlogs, but have you always been interested in yeah. science based? Yeah, it was like performance enhancement, human optimization, um, preventative medicine. All that stuff is highly interesting to me. And it's just, you know, I end up making videos about what I found interesting or learned and felt was useful enough to make a video about. And then other people would also be like, oh. You know, I was wondering about this too, you know, and yeah. here's Derek summarizing it. You know, thank you. Derek, no last name summarizing it. Yeah. Exactly. L- now I know you just like hammered into the whole liver King thing. So we're not going to dive super. I think it's beating a, a dead horse, you yeah. know, with, with that topic. But um, just in terms of talking about people's, I don't want to say natty or not, but you know, you talk a lot of uh, different um uh, celebrities who are trained for this, whether it be like, I don't know, Thor, you know, and you before or after, are they, whether it be natural or not, or yeah. gear usage and things like that. I have a question. Do you think that I am natural? <laughs> I've, I've seen mo- a bunch of vlogs where you're talking about maybe not, but I think you're probably still natural. Why do you, why do you think I'm natural? Because again, what we've learned just because you say you're natural could mean you could just be lying. Yeah. And even, you know, if I'm trying to convince people like, no guys like I, I'm actually the only one that's natural. I could still be a big fat liar. Yeah. I just don't think you have a lot of, uh, 
I don't want to do a whole dissection, but I, I would. I've, I would I've seen he's going to say muscle mass. He's going to say you, you no one who's on gear could look like you. <laughs> you. You don't have a lot of motivation to push the envelope. And from what I've seen of your videos, it's very much like, I don't know, you've considered it, but you don't feel it. The ROI worth it at this point in your life. I'm right more now. think that I would die. Even on TRT? Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I, and this is an actual thought and you might be like, you're an idiot. I had a conversation with my brother a while ago. I thought, you know, they're always watching doing the movies with like, you flick the needle to get like the bubble out, whether yeah. it be you know, just in the hospital or whatever. It's always like flicking it mm-hmm. to bubbles. I thought that if the bubble goes in your body, you die. <laughs> I thought air goes in your body. You're dead. Like I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. Imagine how many people would be dropped dead by now. Turns out you mm-hmm. don't die from the bubble. No, but I thought that if I ever got uh, and and like like there's yours is a good explanation of it of like the ROI doesn't make sense, but I just I thought I would I would die from it or I'd have a bad reaction to it, get the gyno, get the back acne, whatever the negative side effects are, it would be me, and I'm like that's not worth it. Yeah. Why do why do you think people? Uh, why do you think what's like the most common reason people go on it besides just like a uh, uh, health? Like my testosterone is low. I think most guys go on it not for health. If we're talking about act- yeah. actual like bodybuilder cycles, if we're talking about TRT, you know, it gets a bit more nuanced. So I guess it depends in the context that you're that you're uh, asking. But it often is in the fitness industry driven by vanity and security or trying to compete at a high level. But even a lot of those guys, I feel like just very much enjoy pushing the envelope and continuing to progress because as you've seen, you know, after a while you plateau and then it's like you almost have to think of different ways potentially to motivate yourself to keep going because why would I want to go in and keep hitting the same lift for the next seven years and then slowly deteriorate thereafter? That's what I'm that's what I'm experiencing right now. I hit like peak strength and I'm like mm. I'm slowly like going down. We're trying to hold on to it. I'm like scratching the surface. Yeah. So some people mentally they want to have similar to the hedonic treadmill. They want to achieve that next, you know, hit of success. And the only way to do that is pushing the envelope with uh chemicals so are you natty no what drt okay yeah i used to use way more shit though i thought you were gonna go i used to look like you but, <laughs> but now why why did you go down on your all the all the other other shit you were taking uh not conducive to longevity also isn't aligned with what i deem to be a good use of my time because i only have so much mental resources to allocate to things each day and eating copious amounts of food training my ass off for you know six days a week focusing all on that was just not aligned with what i feel to be i don't know what i'm passionate about anymore so early 20s it was more so about i don't know i just very much enjoyed the process similar to what a lot of guys do it for you know it's vanity insecurity stuff like that and you very much get a reward out of seeing continuous progress getting a physique that is deemed to be i don't know unobtainable yeah something like that top tier yeah and it's uh obviously your perception gets massively skewed as you enter into this industry which is very problematic so it becomes often in some people's minds a thing that feels necessary almost to do well which is unfortunate and why is it's also why i like the fact that i'm the talking head guy because i don't feel the pressure to maintain an absurd shredded over-the-top physique like some of the other you know fitness industry type people might where they're like, I need to be in shape all the fucking time. This, that like your avatar is like when you were jacked, right? Ah, uh, yeah. I'll put well, that on the screen. I'm also like, a, I'm also a grower, not a shower. So in the gym, I, aren't uh, we all, yeah. But in the gym, when I get a pump, it's much different than just as you've seen, probably when you, when you walk around in broad daylight, you look wildly different than when you're downlit. Yeah. yeah I'd say I'm like, I'm like 5% better looking when I'm like fully pumped downlit light. Okay. I have low tier genetics. That's another <laughs> thing too. I think if I took a bunch of gear, I think I would just start looking like a guy who actually like lifts. I don't think, I, I don't think I'd like get jacked. I think you're too hard on yourself. Like, I would be interested. I, but I'm, it's because of your fucked up view of the fitness industry too. Cause objectively to the layman, you have visible abs, you have some muscle, you have good lifts. You're yeah. in the top, like top 1% of men in your like age for sure. And even when you're in your mid twenties, same thing. You know, how many guys at the gym, not at maybe alpha land, where yeah. it's like the fucking pinnacle of fitness industry people all congregating into this one messed up like. And I think now, I think now, especially the younger generation, they feel like there has to be this baseline of how insane you need to look to be relevant on the internet, which 
I've tried to preach to people. I'm like, I'm like a prime example of like, you can make it without having to be the biggest dude, the most shredded guy ever, the most inspirational physique ever, like yeah. your personality and who you are can lead you to success. But I think the, the younger kids are thinking they need to have this insane physique. No, yeah, and it's like oftentimes the more successful people in this industry now are guys who don't even compete or guys who don't even have aspirations to be competitive, you know, on stage or anything like that. So it's like obviously there are people on stage who people see as idols or aspire to, and that's, you know, well and good. But there are also individuals like yourself who still are just fit, healthy guys, you know, live a a natural lifestyle and um I think represent, you know, health and fitness. Well, like nothing about what you do is actually the antithesis of what health and fitness really is. Yeah. Performance enhancement, chemical enhancement, cranking your fucking face off, eating copious amounts of food. There's nothing healthy health and fitness really about it. And it's, that's not normal. Like that's not like the, the standard of like how people like, I feel like want to live unless you're trying to have this very specific lifestyle, but it's like, almost like, I think I'm like, what's the point? Like, what's the yeah. point? Unless you're going for this stage to be the best of the best. Why are you putting your health and everything at risk? And w- with all the steroid talk, I-, I just had a, um, my last YouTube upload, um, which did not hit a hundred thousand, like you were <laughs> saying, but, uh, I go on the kind of like my whole rant about this current situation and the state of affair with everything. And there's a lot of people that, you know, you, uh, talk about of like, you know, whether they say they're natural or they don't say anything. Why do you think there's so much of a, of this like mystery of whether like, I guess people lying or, or people saying, you know, not saying anything at all. And usually the response I always say is like, Oh, cause it's illegal, but people are, st- a lot of people are like, I take steroids and are not, I guess, under the fear of the, their door being kicked in because they're saying they're doing something illegal. Like, why do you think, some people are open talking about it when it when it, it is illegal and they're not worried about it. And then some people don't talk about it because they hide behind this shield of whatever. Yeah, it kind of depends because, again, it is nuanced, like you said. But there are a lot of people that are prescribed legitimate therapy that are on steroids because of a doctor prescription. And that's not illegal. So some of those people are comfortable talking about what they do, why they do it. Um, and, yeah, obviously, even in the medical side of things, though, there is some you know finagling that goes on where sometimes you'll have companies that over prescribe and prescribe things that are otherwise not really clinically warranted and you're basically prescribing a steroid cycle essentially um but yeah like if it's uh it all depends on how a person feels comfort wise if they're trying to potentially market something in an unethical way and use their image to kind of accelerate that brand growth or their exposure or their, uh, I don't know, ability to aspire, inspire people to look like them and resemble their lifestyle. And it's not conducive to their narrative to, you know, expose what they're actually doing behind the scenes to maintain that look. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's nuanced and everyone has their own feelings about what they should or shouldn't do or how transparent they should be or not be and what they should keep to themselves or not. And, you know, the hyper extreme example is the liver king. And um, I think people are seeing nowadays what it's weird because I feel like that situation might have happened 20 years ago. It's just really weird that now in the era of transparency, yeah, that sort of thing is still happening. And just people in general, like why have you made it kind of, I don't want to call it like your mission, but like your topics of discussion to let people know, like I'm going to use uh, ones for example. I know you've done a lot with um, like movie stars, whether mm-hmm. it be, I think you did one recently with Chris Hemsworth. He's mm-hmm. Thor, right? Yep. Yeah. Super jacked and whether they like, you know, or, or, you know, use CGI to make them look even bigger or versus what he actually does. And when people are like, you know, this is how, you know, uh, Captain America trained and got this body for the movie. And most people are like, Andy also took a bunch of steroids. Um, I guess like, what, what's your thoughts of, of that? Like why you make that content and why you feel like it's, it's your, your duty to like inform the world about that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I guess years ago I had, similar to how you would talk with your friends behind the scenes like oh what do you think about this guy you think he's on gear and it's just you know gossip between your friends or whatever you know i would have people ask me what do you think about this i'd be like you know what i'm just gonna make a video rather than answer you all separately in a dm make a video it pops off like huh people actually like this stuff Mm -hmm. oh you should talk about this guy okay sure you guys like this topic okay i'll make a video about this guy and then through those videos i was able to educate at a scale as well that goes beyond the the novelty or the, I don't know, entertainingness 
Like, do you think? Yeah, like a natty or not speculation video. I could transition it into something to do with interpreting blood work or something to to do with, I don't know, preventative medicine in some capacity or something to do with how to not fuck yourself up if you're doing that stuff. So it was very much like a hybrid of this is what people find entertaining and have highly requested. And this is some sort of educational tangent that I feel is still insightful and informational that can come from it. Do you ever did? I mean, because like I was joking about earlier in your vocabulary and your knowledge on the situation, I consider yourself yourself someone who is very knowledgeable of, uh, I guess, results and why someone could be unnatural. And you know about the science of steroids, gear, all that stuff. Um, have you ever had anyone, I guess, question your validity on like, oh, for sure. And that's something I, I do struggle with a little bit is the fact that, like I said, the More Plates, More Dates channel started when I was in my early 20s. And for me, it was just a, a name of a brand that I thought made sense at the time. Yeah. It's like, oh, this overarchingly covers men's self-improvement. You know, let's go. The URL is available. Channel name, same thing. Boom. Good to go. And then years later, as it turns into this more widespread brand name, I guess, and it's associated with me as I get older, I feel less aligned with just objectively what it is on the surface. And I find there's like somewhat of a barrier to entry, not only because again, not a doctor. So it's not like I have medical credentials when I'm talking about some of this stuff, which is why I have a hefty disclaimer. And when I tell people to get blood work or whatever I say about medical services, I defer them to places that I feel are high quality that have medical oversight by actual credentialed physicians who are authorized to do that kind of stuff. So a lot of it is just informing on what I find interesting, looked into myself, take that information for what you will, but use a doctor and like run these things by them. Do not listen to a YouTuber. And that's not just me. Like I wouldn't, there are a lot of people who use their, their MD or their doctor status to prop themselves up as this, you know, authority figure, which I think is becoming more and more frowned upon nowadays. But yeah, there's definitely a level of, uh, you know, I'm not going to listen to this uh, douchey YouTuber, bodybuilder dude, or more plates, more dates. That sounds silly. Everyone's a doctor in the comment section. You're like, <laughs> damn, dude, everyone has their, everyone has yeah. their MD. Like, yeah. <laughs> which is, have you ever uh, been incorrect about something and had to like, cl- be like, I was actually wrong about whatever. Yeah. I used to, I made a video a long time ago that actually popped off about drinking egg whites. And I thought it was a very, very good way to get in. What was, what was it about? Uh, drinking egg whites, bro. You've never seen those like cartons of pasteurized egg no, whites? No, no, I, I, I do. Like, what was the thing yeah, you it was said? A, it was okay. So, it was about getting in a high amount of protein in a short period of time. This is a source that a lot of people aren't aware of. It tastes almost like sugar water. Some people might disagree, but to me, it tastes like nothing really. Yeah. And that is a very, very dense source of protein with a relative lack of fat, uh, calories, et cetera. Right. And high quality protein. What I was under the impression at the time that you could just drink it pasteurized and it would absorb full and you'd be good. Like I got out of the car, like egg white. Yeah, cartons. straight up just slamming it. And I've, my friends have done that. Yeah. I, I've probably tried it. Yeah, but there is something called avidin in the egg whites that are pasteurized that is not fully denatured. So it can cause a biotin deficiency. And it's I don't not know as, what you're saying. <laughs> that's going to make it into the intro. <laughs> say, say it as if we're golden doodles. So it's like you have a, it's much more difficult to absorb it. And there is a, binding protein that can give you a deficiency of a vitamin if you don't if you drink a lot of it and don't cook it and so how did you come to this conclusion was it just a, for the a doctor in the, the no, comments it was just people suggesting that they thought this was how it actually was and then me digging into it further and it's it's difficult because when you google this stuff there are companies that sell egg whites yeah, like that in, the, are meant, in, the, in the jug now like yeah, that are squirted me- out yeah that are actually marketed to drink as mm-hmm. pasteurized and oh it's you know all the bacteria is gone and the protein is fully bioavailable and the pasteurization process like fully denatures this like binding protein issue but when you actually dig into it into the literature it does not seem to be the case it's not it's not something that doesn't work at all but it's not optimal so if you were to drink 60 grams of egg whites yeah what's, might, ha- what's happening like you're only absorbing you might absorb like a fraction of it um i forget the exact percentage off the top of my head but it could be much higher if you cook them and then also this you could end up with a biotin deficiency if you don't supplement with biotin or biotin's hair and nail growth right yeah it's just a b vitamin that is you know if you're deficient in any vitamin because you've been totally like rendering it useless in your body you're going to have some manifestation of side effects for sure See, I'm in the mindset. I'm like, no, no, no. If it says 50 grams and I'm drinking it, 
that's 50 grams knocked out for the day. I don't care what anyone says. It's for some people it might be, you know, they might get away with it just fine. Like I, back in the day, I had no issues when I, and I'd slam an absurd amount, but um, it definitely isn't the most tolerable on the GI. It could be, you know, some people just get straight up liquid diarrhea after, which is not great. Gastrointestine. I know that one. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, the biotin thing and the bioavailability is not ideal, but it's super convenient. It's efficient. At the time, I thought it was totally, you know, one of the best ways you could get in protein super easily. And it's going to suck in like 10, 15 years and more shit comes out of like, oh, you guys been eating or taking all this. Turns out it was shit. You weren't getting anything from no nutrients from that. Yeah, that's some people have told me I should write a book or this would be a good idea. But I, to me, the idea of having something out there as your cornerstone flagship thing that you're putting your name behind and then not being able to edit it in the future or put out edition two. Yeah. Edition three. Yeah. And it's like, but I can't even imagine having print copies of that and trying to amend certain things. Like if you found out something was totally untrue Mm -hmm. or partially untrue or inconclusive after a while and you thought it was otherwise the definitive correct thing. And then knowing you have thousands of hard copies out there with your name behind it as this is the cornerstone of my brand. Yeah. I just don't, (laughs) I can't imagine that personally. Yeah, no, I I can, I can understand that. Which is why the ever evolving uh, YouTube channel is so great because you can just come out tomorrow. Like, guess what? I found out this. And And you're like, another, another video idea in the books, which is always a a settling thing. You're like, I got another one. Exactly. How many videos do you put out like a, like a week or it used to be. I got up to two a day frequency for about nine to 10 months, I think. Maybe. And, and you could make a video like on like something just comes out. You're like, sit down, yeah. put it out. Yeah. And I got very regimented about that to a point where I had, I had a send. Obviously, I wasn't this deluded, but I almost convinced myself something bad was going to happen to me if I didn't get the video out. You just put it after you've done it for enough time, you sort of. I don't know. Have you ever had gone to failure on a set and you say something in your head to try and motivate yourself to get through that last rep? You know, something, something that is makes you angry or everyone on YouTube is going to do thumbs down if I fail this. That's what goes through my <laughs> yeah, head. Yeah. So, and it's like, that's not actually going to happen, but you try to convince yourself of something like that to kind of push through. So I sort of did that with the videos, like something bad is going to happen if I break this streak. So I went on a streak of like nine, 10, maybe even a year of, I don't remember exactly, but it was two videos a day because that frequency at the time seemed to be the most conducive to growth and also helped me cover a wide array of topics without ha- being limited by time. Because if I if there's a trending topic or something I really want to talk about, it doesn't get outdated very fast because if I'm doing one a week, I only have, I have to be way more hyper-specific about what I'm choosing to talk about. I can't cover every single topic that comes my way that I find interesting. So, but now... Super infrequent, dude. Like it's uh, well, you're you're doing a lot of things now. Yeah, it's uh, becomes very difficult to balance scaling businesses whilst also doing content on that frequent of a scale. Yeah, so it's like I don't know. Sometimes it's like once a week. Sometimes it is a few times a week, and then it'll be nothing for a few weeks. It kind of depends. Now I have not achieved the cadence that is consistent lately. So it's when people subscribe to you, they're just like one day. So at some point it's going to pop up that you got a new video to, to yeah. go and you've kind of like broken out of just, we'll call it the, the bro bodybuilding steroid world. And now you go into, um, scientifically dismantling <laughs> supplements and stuff. And one yeah. you did recently that I was very interesting to me just cause I'm in like the, you know, CPG world. But when you did one on like Logan Paul's prime and him comparing oh, yeah. it to liquid IV, um, I guess like, uh, what's your, what's your interest level in like not fitness related just, well, I guess it is, it's, it's fitness, but just going in the science of like drinks and energy drinks and, you know, influencers who aren't fitness people and talking about like their stuff is it because you disagree with like, like claims people are making. And I, I get your opinions on Logan Paul's the prime of it's better than this when you're like, eh, is it? Yeah, no, it's just anything that aligns with, what I'm interested in essentially. And it's not always about PEDs or pharmacology or blood work. It's oftentimes, you know, like the electrolyte drink for me, it was just wild to see some of his claims being blatantly stated as if they were fact. I'm like, bro, that's totally incorrect. <laughs> I, I, th- I think his, I think, and, and not really just, I mean, I'm not trying to like call it specifically like that drink, but it's a lot of people like, uh, Th- their audience is not someone who maybe cares about the the science that yeah. maybe like 
No, you should. It's funny. I was thinking about doing a video reacting to the children in my comment section who came. What from was it? What they like? Like you're just jealous of Logan. <laughs> He's way more successful. You fucking loser. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that sort of thing was. Uh, it was funny because you could see the vast disparity between the people who are yeah understanding the video or followers of mine or people who you know didn't know about it and were otherwise educated by it and were appreciative or whatever and then just some fucking kid who comes in he's like KSI is the shit Fuck it, you. it's it's weird seeing like when you state like hey like this isn't really like my opinion this is like a fact of a and b yeah and why they're different why one's better why one's not superior here's yeah. the facts to back it up and someone still like disagrees you're like how can you disagree it's yeah. like i'm stating a fact yeah and it yeah, for me, it's, it's more so just, especially because the way he came at another brand as if he had the scientific infrastructure of his argument to support what he was saying in such a clear way, like, this is liquid IV. They're supposed to be the best, but actually ours has this, 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 and this, and they suck, essentially. It is a weird angle of like, yeah. this company focuses on the betterment of rehydration, electrolytes, and has been doing it for like a while, and it's like, but to even this influencer actually mastered it overnight. Yeah. What the fuck? And it's Logan, the guy who spends so much time researching shit, right? <laughs> He's always talked about electrolytes and, and yeah. it's it's interesting. No, I just I thought it was a poorly thought out angle of his or the company that otherwise, you know, encouraged him to do it. Because they could have just said something like the leading competitor, um, you know, focuses on this and we deem it to be better to do this. But it was very specific. I don't like this that. is this this. It would be like if somebody was like, here's sour strips, here's smart sweets or whatever. Yeah. And like, this is why it tit for tat our shits on them. That that's why actually that's one, one thing that we, and hopefully we haven't, cause I try to make it a, uh, a point to even my, my team to make sure we never do is, you know, I'm always like, you know, stating how our, our candies, you know, the best sour candy, right? Whatever. But I've made it a very specific thing that like, I was like, we're never going to make ours you know, seem like the best by bashing another company specifically. Cause I don't like that specific angle. We can state how good ours is and we can let people have their opinion on it. But I think to be like ours is better than this brand a, they suck because of this. I don't like that. Yeah. And like, for me, it could come across as hypocritical because I make these videos that are dismantling products. It's like, well, you're doing exactly that. And that's just part of my my content. Like I very much value the scientific integrity behind formulations, and mm -hmm. that's what I interest myself in. So that's why when people request a video, if I feel it to be you know an interesting topic as well, I very I'm careful to not try and like pull in my comparable product though if it's about something that we happen to have in the same product offering category. So when, so that it makes it seem like you're trying yeah. Because again, it could easily come off that way and you know, to some extent, propping yourself up as some sort of authoritative figure on this topic. Like I could see why anyone would extrapolate out like, oh, this is like a, like a tactic of some sort. And it's like, I don't think it's totally off base to be somebody who puts out a statement about this is what I believe to be the scientific information that reinforces, you know, the integrity of this formula. And this is what I believe to be correct and why. And then it's just up in the air for people to, just, to decide, but it's more about like for him, again, I would have never even made the video in that fashion. Maybe I would have at some point, but it would have been far more uh, soft and yeah. not, uh, you know, like I, I don't, I'm not a part, a part of Liquid IV. I've never been sponsored by them, but it was just the fact that he was like, here they are. Not good. Our shit's on theirs. Good. Here's yeah. why. Boom, 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 boom. Rather than here's Prime. This is why it's superior to other brands. Boom, 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 boom. Leading competitors might have something like this, but even that is inferior to ours because of this, this, and this, but not just straight up pulling out the fucking top tier compet competitor yeah. and being like this, not good. Terrible. Don't get this. Get this. Yeah. There's a difference of like others are doing this. Our, ours has this and it's superior because of these reasonings rather than just being like, they suck. We're better than them because this buy our shit over their shit. It's just a different angle. And yeah, I, I guess, you know, different strokes for different folks. I mean, I guess, you know, he was like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I wonder if it was his idea or I don't know, somebody encouraged him to do it or what, because again, you could just obviously call it, this is just marketing and like deal with it because he could say whatever the fuck he wants. And if it's, I don't, I don't really know if there's like a, a legal implication to the way he frames it, but presumably not. So yeah. it's like, if that works for them and he doesn't mind being called out on it a little bit. He obviously doesn't give a fuck and it works works out well if anything it's the tactic of like doing things to get reactions of like yeah. i'm gonna do this because people are gonna go attack it but it's just gonna put more attention on my brand no matter what 
you know, any press is, you know, bad press, good press. It's all, you know, it's all letting people know about Prime who maybe didn't know about it. Yeah. And one of the things he did too that was kind of misleading is I think he compared to a Gatorade product that had calories in it when they also have a product offering that was zero calorie and comparable to what they have. And he was like, this is, you know, the top company Gatorade, and this is why they're not as good. It's like, you're not even talking about the most comparable product offering that they have that is directly relevant to what you're, the context in which you're shitting on them. Yeah. Which I thought was kind of unfair. Different marketing, I guess. Yeah. Seems to be working somewhat well for them, but even though people disagree with it, but in your, um, your, brands that you have mm-hmm. uh, are very science-based, right? Why, why don't we dive into a little bit of your businesses? Derek, how do you, how do you make your money? Um, so when I started, it was mostly around affiliate income. So like something that I use off of Amazon or something that a brand has that I've been using for years. If I get an affiliate link, you know, through a video where I talk about it, this is why I use this product over other ones. And that would be generating some sort of income. And then that also transitioned into when I was the formulator for that other supplement company, I would get paid per article I write and then a salary. And then as I started to build my own brands, um, I was very much always enterprise value minded. So I never, um, I don't really make money. I'm sure you're similar. The companies make money. Yeah. The companies make money, but I very much try to reinvest as much as I can to a degree where I use a minimal amount to support, support my lifestyle. And then it's all put back into the company. So, But yeah, like the making, how the money is generated company to company. One is a dietary supplement company, Gorilla Mind. Um, That was, I think we started 2018. Then I have Merrick Health, which is a preventative medicine platform with a bunch of doctors essentially that give you oversight of diagnostics. They will, you can get your blood work done. You could just get it done yourself and get uh, um, like a cursory overview of your health status, or you could have a medical provider actually dig in in elaborate detail and dissect where you have imbalances, deficiencies, areas you could optimize. And it's not just to do with hormones because a lot of people kind of assume these clinics exist to, oh, you just want to get on TRT? Here's a TRT prescription. That's so not what we try to be. Like a very, uh, I I think less than even 50% of our patients are actually on TRT right now, which is actually, it sounds like a lot still, and it is, but it's a lot of these companies exist only to do that. And we are still seen as the foremost, I would say one of the foremost experts in that endocrine hormone optimization space for the guys who are on TRT and want high quality oversight or even bodybuilders who are using, you know, high amounts of gear and otherwise need a non-judgmental doctor to oversee them and make sure they fuck themselves up as little as possible that we do cover. But then we're also about natural optimization. What are all the things you can do before getting on TRT to make sure things are dialed in, make sure you don't haphazardly get on it because you thought you needed it because somebody encouraged you to get on it from another clinic that only wants to sell you medications, that kind of thing. That, that, that company, Merrick Health, you, you say you have a lot of, is that like you outsource doctors? You have like people under you? Like how, how is that like operated? Because I, yeah, I just I didn't didn't know, you know, the other businesses you had besides, you know, yourself and Gorilla. Yeah. So it's like an umbrella entity that has doctors, patient care coordinators, um, other staff as well underneath it. And they all like I'm as well as other individuals who are educators drive traffic to the platform, which then kind of like trickles down into you either get, you know, diagnostic lab work. And then from there, the doctors that are working with Merrick will otherwise, you know, support those patients by getting them, uh, you know, interpretation of their blood work and then potentially prescriptions if warranted, but oftentimes just lifestyle recommendations, diet protocol changes, sleep hygiene manipulation, stuff like that is uh, commonplace. And a lot of people think they need stuff from the pharmaceutical side that actually don't. And then they find out, oh, well, I was being misled or, you know, the, there's other things I could be doing that, uh, lead to a higher quality of life, performance, et cetera. When did you start that company? 2021, we launched at the start of the year. Okay. Yeah. And then you have uh, Intelligent Shop. Yeah. What is that? It's kind of like a miscellaneous company for just a bunch of stuff that- It seemed like that. Yeah. It'll turn into more of a, I don't know. I actually don't know for sure what it's going to turn into, (laughs) but right now it's very much stuff that is not dietary supplement related specifically. And also nothing to do with preventative medicine or medical services or anything. It's just like miscellaneous products that 
I use have been highly passionate about like back in the day when I was more the more dates, more more plates, more dates side of stuff, doing everything. I would go get uh get girls to rate fragrances, for example, and I would find out, you know, what are the most highly complimented colognes or you know, I would even like field test colognes when I was a bouncer and see which ones got me the most compliments, as absurd yeah. as that sounds. But I have like a pretty like a relatively diverse fragrance collection. I'm sort of a I'm not like a hardcore connoisseur. What's but your what's your top top fragrance? Just overarchingly. Um, yeah, but before obviously it's it's your company now, but before that, what was your it depends on the situation because it's like again as like as like a somebody who's a fanatic of fragrances you would different t- situation yeah it's like situational because it's like there's going so- to a nice date or I'm going to like the club because you wouldn't wear a fragrance that comes across as you know high sex appeal or whatever in an office for example so it kind of depends what I wore Sex Panther every day when I worked corporate oh yeah I I've only worn one cologne since college and I still just one cologne what is it Chanel Blue oh nice love it. Which one, the EDP or the EDT? Uh, you know? I, the, the toilet, the perfume. I, I get the toilet, I think. Isn't okay. perfume like the stronger one? Uh, yeah. One the, of them is the stronger one. Yeah, the Eau de Parfum is like a higher uh, fragrance oil concentration. Mm. Yeah. See, I, I, see, I can't wrap my head around, okay, tonight is, I want this type of musk. I'm just like, yeah. I want to smell good every st- situation. So there's situational yeah, like obviously that's not something that everyone feels appropriate. Like there are fragrances that I think are more hybrid and di- diverse you could wear in a multitude of settings. But for example, you wouldn't wear, you know, Sex Panther in the gym. You would wear like an, <laughs> an aquatic fresh or nothing, just something that's very inoffensive and light. If that just smells like you're fresh out of the shower sort of thing. I, at most. I yeah. never like, I've never dissected yeah. smells. I'm sure there's a whole community. Cause I, that's oh, what yeah. I'm, I'm like all these different fragrances. I'm like, just find one you like and wear the one. I'm like, why do I want 10 different colognes? But apparently there's a thing. So your company, you found um, the colognes and you kind of have like your uh, enhanced versions of popular ones. Um, yeah. So the, the fragrance is just one thing that we offer. I have hair loss prevention products as well, which is something that I've made a lot of contents about. And for years, I, I would talk about, uh, like the main products that actually work rather than there's a lot of weird, sketchy shit that is sold out there that doesn't actually work. And it's based on like not great literature. Cause you have like, I mean, you have shampoos and then the, the thing that I saw on there, that's, um, you know, I, I, I first I was like, is this like a hair care company? Yeah. But you have like the minoxidil. Yeah. Is that how you say it? Yeah. And that's the beard stuff. Well, it's meant for hair, but it's also works on oh. your beard. Yeah. I thought, what's, what's the, what's the big company that. Rogaine. Rogaine. Yeah. So that's just branded minoxidil. But what? It, so it's just minoxidil. Could you just rub m- Rogaine on your face? Yeah, technically. I've seen people that use the minoxidil. Am I saying, I'm saying that right. If you go to my channel, you type in beard you will see some wild before and afters of guys who had no beard and they look like jason momoa after. but see i okay i have friends that have used this stuff to grow a beard who couldn't grow it they grow patchy i'm someone who clearly cannot grow facial hair mm-hmm. but i in my mind i can i don't want to say i can always tell but like if i'm like if your body doesn't naturally want to grow a beard and then you use these things like it doesn't look like i see people that use minoxidil and then i look at my brother who naturally has a full facial hair and has for a long time and i'm like they don't look the same. Hmm. And I'm always like, it's almost like the unnatural looking, but you, th- you but you think <laughs> it's like, you're like not natty. You're yeah, you, fake, you fake natty. Yeah. But is it like, if I put that on my face, I would grow facial hair. I would look like you. The, I actually don't use it on my face. So no, no, I'm saying I, I, I think you have a, just a, a normal beard. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. There is something called micro needling too. That doubles your results that a lot of people don't know about. And they could do. Have you ever seen those little uh, roller devices on Amazon that have little needles sticking out of them? No, no. People use it to like, uh, girls micro needling. Yeah, they, like- they get rid of scars and it's like an anti-aging thing, but it also recruits growth factors to the area that otherwise wouldn't be there and also enhances the absorption of the minoxidil. So people that add that on top of the Whoa. minoxidil application, they will, in general, they can double the results from what I've seen. I, I don't like to get rid of my scars because they remind me that the past is real. But if I put, you would think, I, do you think I would grow a beard if I put, your minoxidil or minoxidil on my face. Yeah. I'll send you some. Do you actually think I'll grow a beard? Yeah. I just can't wrap my head around Dude, it. Dude, go to my channel and type in beard and see some of the before and after. Th- th- Pull up your phone. This is, I don't even have it with me. I this is why we need a screen. Yeah. But this is the type of situation. I'm like, kind of like how I said, I would never, you know, never do gear. Cause I would be the guy that would have a bad reaction. I think I'm be the guy 
I'd be like, you know what? I'm going to grow a facial hair so I can, I don't know, look more like a man. And then I would, I'd put it on and I would be the 1% of people that have shit results. It's patchy. Okay. Look at, uh, this guy on the top. We're going to put it on the screen right here. Oh, hold on, it went up. Uh, the guy on the top thumbnail. Well, I mean, okay. So like the guy in the top left is, is him before it. And yeah. that's after. Yeah. I just can't wrap my so, so, a medicine would just make me become a mountain man. Yeah, essentially. Here's a maybe a, Do you have to keep using maybe it or? a more realistic example for a guy who's not like a hyper responder, I would say. Huh. Yeah, but see, like even he has something. The, no disrespect to the guy, but he has like the shitty patchy you think? facial genetics. Like I don't grow <laughs> I don't grow hair here, man. Like like I think you, this looks pretty like filled out you in see, the after. I, I have like the neck beard, this little like facial hair, and yeah. then my mustache. This is all I grow. I don't grow I don't grow any patchiness. So it wouldn't be like Oh, it's just going to fill in the patches. I would need it to literally grow facial hair on my entire face. Well, worst case scenario is you just shave it off if you don't like it. Yeah, but then it would keep growing. I get little prickly things on my face, That's dude. True. Yeah. I think everyone thinks they want a beard, but I think later down the road, Make you're like, more work for themselves. yeah, I'm just like, now I got a fucking, sh I use the electric razor, hmm. never a regular one, but electric razor every other day just to get rid of that. Hmm. I can't imagine doing all of it here. I yeah. might try it. Cutting into your TikTok time. It is cutting into my, <laughs> but no, I could, I can, I could do that and watch TikToks at the same ah, time. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Okay. So besides hair growth, you know, the, would you say the, your the most, uh, the company that brings in the, let's say the most revenue at the moment supplements. Yeah. Okay. And then I, luckily the other businesses that you keep the money in your social media doing extremely well, probably is that's like kind of more able to support your lifestyle without needing to siphon money from your businesses. Yeah. Why did you start the supplement company? Because I, I find it a very interesting company. I want to I want to dive into it. Um, so for me, that same business partner who hired me to his company, he eventually saw the value in me above and beyond just as a uh, blog writer or formulator or guy who answers all the social media comments or the emails or whatever. Like mm -hmm. I was very much doing customer service, like everything when I first started with that company. Then he was like, what if we start this company? And can you create a new tropic for me? Because this was a new product entirely that he was wanting to get done. I don't know if you've heard of new tropics or cognitive enhancing supplements. And he had become more and more disconnected with the progression in the fitness industry of, you know, supplement formulations, kind of new literature, what works, what doesn't. And he trusted me. So he said, hey, would you be open to doing this new venture with me? So you have a business partner. Yeah. Okay. And um, that process, like I created... Gorilla Mind was the first nootropic formula is also our first product. And from there it transitioned into, oh, well, maybe we should try a, a sleep formula. So we made Gorilla Dream. And then after that, it was, oh, people like pre-workouts. Uh, it was weird that that wasn't even something that like stuff that's basic and would occur to you. You would think normally doesn't occur to you. Like at the time when we first started, we're like, we're a nootropic company. Okay. We're not going to do pre-workouts. That's not what we do. And then eventually it was like, I still use pre-workouts just from other companies. And then after a while, it was, Derek, what would you want to see in a pre-workout? What would you make if you were to make one? I was like, okay, well, I'll make one. And we made Gorilla Mode, and then it popped off. I made like an hour and a half video dissecting, you know, exactly why I put in each ingredient, what the reinforcing literature was behind it, what stuff I didn't include and why. And I guess that video really resonated with people. It's like an hour and a half movie about a pre-workout. and it has Of like, your own pre-workout? Yeah, it has like, I don't know, 800,000 views or something. Okay. Yeah. And, and so do you own 50% of the company? Yeah, I own half of it. Okay. And so why, why did you, why the angry monkey gorilla? Like why gorilla, gorilla mind is a company, gorilla mode is a pre-workout or vice versa. Mind. Yeah. It's again, it, this is like a, a thing we struggle with too, is because we've been built up. The, the pre-workout is so popular that people often think that gorilla mode is the name that's of the brand. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. And we've been trying to consider how we kind of pivot on that because that's not ideal even when you have certain athletes that are like i'm sponsored by gorilla mode it's like, it's like, well, that's not even the company name <laughs> i can i can tell you really know what you're talking about yeah so um for us it was based around um uh my business partner's close friend he was the one who actually brought the idea of this new tropic to us or like he he was very interested in it and chris was very good friends with this guy and he had a book around it was called gorilla mindset and it was about, you know, men's self-improvement, self-help, 
um, furthering your, I don't know, becoming like a better. I thought it was going to be about how gorillas think. Yeah. <laughs> like, like the gorilla mindset. It's yeah. like, okay. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he, he had this book that was fairly popular called gorilla mindset and he was into nootropics and he wanted to see something get made around it. And this name became just, you know, something that could be trademarked. And it sort of just sounded good at the time. It was aligned with at least a term that was somewhat popular. And that's just what it turned into. Like there wasn't a whole lot of thought behind it, to be honest, other than that. And you've had great success with it. And I'm sure when you were developing it, you're like, okay, uh, I need to make sure that what's in this will not get scientifically dismantled (laughs) by someone else. Yeah. So as we progress, though, too, I often dismantle myself and will go back and revise it. It becomes more difficult as you scale because you'll be holding a ton of inventory you have to work through before you can then phase it out into something else. But yeah, like I'm continuously trying to update our stuff and make it as good as possible. Yeah, I used to dismantle myself, but then I got a girlfriend, so I didn't have, you know, it doesn't get as lonely, you know? Yeah. Congrats on that. (laughs) You've been working on that for a while. I know. I've been seven years, man. (laughs) I appreciate that. Do you have a girlfriend? Yeah. Uh, How long have you been together? Almost two years. Mm. We're getting close. Are you going to be more than a girlfriend soon? I don't know. We'll see. Ooh, that's exciting. Okay. Back to the business. Uh, what's interesting about the company. So not only is it, it's fucking everywhere, which is, you know, cool to see even at another, uh, I'll, you're a businessman, but you know, you're, in, uh, you're an influencer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's cool to see other influencers who are creating physical products and, you know, you've uh, established a, a couple different things, not just, you know, the, I guess the standard of whether it be a clothing line, a supplement company, it's kind of like, I, not everyone, but it's more like it's realistic of like, okay, I expected them to kind of come out with it. But you have other things that are very um, specific to you, which is cool to see and the success. And, and your business is built very uh, much on influencer marketing. Mm-hmm. And you guys have gone, I, I say gone ham. And like the, we talked about the TikTok world earlier, but that's if TikTok's like, you love TikTok because of like, you've probably gotten a lot of people who are able to get the product out there on that application, right? Yeah, that's the interesting thing is a lot of our um, the people who we have that are mainly TikTok built platforms, I guess, who have then transitioned to Instagram and YouTube, they will typically talk about the products more on YouTube and Instagram than TikTok. But yeah, we very much have some very big creators that are started their careers on TikTok. Their biggest following is on TikTok just on the surface. And um, yeah, we don't like intentionally push on TikTok, though, like we've done no paid ads there. Um, as far as I know, we haven't really even facilitated any specific plugs on that pl- platform entirely. It's usually Instagram stories and integrated into YouTube vlogs and stuff. Okay. Yeah. And, and a lot of the athletes that you have, um, you know, you've changed a lot of their lives. I know that they're able, you know, f- financially, they're able to, you know, working with a lot of companies, including yours, able to, you know, elevate their life. Mm-hmm. They're <sighs> fucking word again, dude. Well, was hedonic. The hedonic, their hedonic lifestyle. You're yeah. making theirs go, go up. And I, I guess it's, uh, which is wild to see them. It's so hyper accelerated nowadays. And it's very that it's <laughs> like, it makes me very, very mindful of, I don't know the mental health. I worry about some of these really young guys. Cause they have, don't even have like a developed prefrontal cortex yet. And they're getting tons of money, like mm-hmm. Unfathomable amounts that back when we were 21, 22, we were working. I don't know about you, but I was working for like, I don't know, 15 bucks an hour or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So back then, trying to imagine dealing with like some level of fame, some level of some absurd level of monetary success, and then having that be your expectation baseline. Like I see um, the challenge too for some of these guys. Like as much as it's wild how successful they are and it's awesome, I also do, uh, Um, I don't know. Do you worry a little bit? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like I check on them sometimes like you're good, dude. Cause I've sometimes they'll, uh, they're very much used to some levels of success where anything less than that, if they don't have a great month or whatever, um, even if, if it's objectively insanely good, their standards, even at such a young age are so high now and it's wild. Well, it's when I compare, you know, when I was coming up on social media to now, again, that hyper accelerated growth is insane to see these people kind of blown up overnight and having being able to convert maybe they don't have like their own brand but they're able to convert sales on astronomical levels and you know i'm i'm the old head in the in the space and you see the the younger influencers maybe it's people you sponsor maybe it's you know people i know there's 
I, I look at the brands like, let's say like the young LA people making insane sales, mm-hmm. whatever, just influencers making a lot of money, um, you know, 70, 80, 90 K every month or something. And then you see them buying Lambos and buying all this stuff. And I'm the old person that's like, man, like, I don't know, maybe you should be blowing all your money like that. But then, like you said, what, if I was 22, 23, I mean, I would, I think we're similar with like our success and our, let's say financial is kind of like grown over time. It wasn't this like, boom, like overnight type, Ob- type of objectively to a normal business person though. They would look at you and I and be like, no, yours was very much like this. Uh, it, it was not, but like I, I, I say, that in like, the past two years, I guarantee yours has hyper accelerated. It's very much a snowball. It, 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 okay, it has. But relative to now, it just gets more and more condensed as correct, years progress. Correct. But I guess I, and I'm the person of like, these people probably shouldn't be spending all this money on those cars. But it, like you said, like I can't imagine 23 year old Max, 24 year old Max making $100,000 a month. I could, I, I'm like, I think I would probably be at the club every single weekend buying six bottles and yeah. like pouring it on my Rolex and shit, you know, like yeah. I can't imagine that lifestyle. Um, do you, do you ever give or like financial advice to anyone? Or are you just kind of like, you can do whatever the fuck you want with your money. If somebody wants advice and um, you know, they want some level of mentorship and they ask me a question, you know, I will tell them what I think. And yeah, that happens sometimes. It's not a, Um, I think it's important that people keep themselves grounded and aware and conscious of, you know, you can't always perceive that your decisions, if they're good or bad, especially when you're younger, unfortunately, it's very, uh, your perception of things as much as you think you're thinking rationally. Like when I look back to some of my 21 year old decisions, like what the fuck was I thinking back then, but it seemed logical and perfectly thought out back then. So yeah, I think it's important to surround yourself with people who are, I don't know, like mentors, especially finding a good mentor who is uh, successful, but also matured more in their career. If it's ideally relevant to what you're doing too, it's not just some arbitrary random advice, but it's actually in the space that you're in getting that kind of, you know, keeping your head from getting too big and also keeping your, I don't know, decisions, rational, logical, calculated for longevity, as opposed to just, um, I don't know. And also being hyper aware of how well you're actually doing and being uh, grateful for it in the moment. Cause yeah. I'm sure you similar to me struggle with, even when you're successful, sometimes it's hard to appreciate it. And you're very much thinking about what's the next thing rather than sitting there and actually absorbing what's actually happening right now. For sure. For yeah. sure. And I want to kind of bring it back to the beginning of the podcast when we talked about, um, you know, you not changing, let's say your background for whatever reason, the relatability, you know, yeah. whatever. And then obviously, you know, you keep your life very private in terms of maybe how, how much success you're having. And even, you know, I don't see you flexing your Lambo, for example. Right. And you kind of compare it to, I, I think that, you know, we have our own opinion on flexing, showing off, but I think there's a lot of like that new generation with that insane money. Like that's like their thing is to show like a lot of my success is to show how successful I am by buying all these things. And it's kind of a different strategy, right? Cause if I went and bought a Lambo tomorrow while I can, I don't. Yeah. And, um, and it's like, I think if I did it, people, it would negatively impact people's perception of me. That's not yeah. why I don't buy it. I have other reasons, but like, you know, while some people like their thing is like, he's inspirational because of like, look what he can buy. Look what he can buy. Um, the problem is that you may have to keep that up for so long and keep, keep inspiring on a financial level of how ballin' you are. Um, what's your thoughts on people kind of going that route versus maybe like building themselves as like a, a business, you know? Yeah. I don't think everyone needs to build a business. Like I think it's very much uh, trendy now to be the entrepreneur and, oh, you, you need to not work for somebody else sort of thing. Like, I don't think that's necessarily um, something that everyone has to do. Like, I know plenty of successful people who work for other companies. Like, you, like that's not a bad thing. I think some people think that like, if you don't have your own business, like you, like everyone, like you have, you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to start it, which I don't agree. I, not everyone's cut out to be an yeah. entrepreneur. No. And it's like so much stress too. It that is. You <laughs> hold the burden of, and you know, supporting however many people are working for you and this and that, like, it's very much a, um, you know, something you have to be very, very, 
I don't know, oriented. Like, I don't think anyone should do it just for the sake of doing it because they think it's the thing they need to do. Like it could be a good hedge for longevity, creating a brand that outlives your existing channel, for example. So it could be a smart, calculated strategy, or you're just highly passionate about it and think you, there's a hole in the industry to fill that you're filling or it's a way for you to make money. But I don't think everyone needs to do it. You can be hyper successful and not just capture that lightning in a bottle, make your, make your money and then worry about down the road. What, what's your thoughts on the uh, flex culture of success versus the I don't like to say it's just flex versus being humble. Mm-hmm. I think you can buy nice things and you can show the world your nice things and be proud of the level of success you've gotten to um, in a, uh, I don't even want to use the word like pretentious, but in like a, a boisterous way of like, you know, yeah. look at this shit I bought versus like, hey guys, I worked really hard for this. Like, cause you, you know, I, there's not certain individuals, but like you, you see people out there that are like making sure people know how successful they are kind of like on a, weekly basis, monthly basis versus the people who, you know, are crushing it, who maybe aren't like letting everyone reminding them how well they're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone has their own perception about what's douchey versus not like, are you, a um, somebody who shouldn't be aspired to be like, because you flex your belongings or not. Like, I think the problem, I don't really care if people show off their stuff and especially if it's fr- friends of mine, there is definitely a inherent feeling that you don't want to say when you're successful or to even say when you've had an achievement that might be deemed to be unattainable for somebody else, because there are very few people who will actually relate to you and be happy for you. Oftentimes they will think it's like, I forget what the saying is it's you're, you're happy for the other person being successful unless they're more successful than you. Until you, 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 you like want people to be, you're rooting for people to be successful until they get there and yeah. then you're, jealous and yeah it's a far more articulate saying than yeah. what i just said but you get the point so that sort of thing there are very few people typically once you become very successful like yourself like i'm sure there are very few people you can talk about well i don't know maybe maybe not but monumental achievements in a revenue capacity or a whatever that doesn't maybe come across as um to i don't know boasting some unattainable thing for somebody else. So might, you might only tell a Christian about it or somebody who can actually be like, fuck yeah, dude, like great job. You know, like, I, mean? I guess there's just two different sides. Cause you know, some people like are like, that's so inspirational that they're able to buy all these th- material things. Yeah. I, they're inspirational because of this. And like, while some people go the route of like, I think it's going to hurt the things that I'm doing. If I show the things that I can buy. Yeah. And I think the only, real problematic thing, at least from my perception, because again, I don't really care if somebody shows off their belongings is, you know, deemed it appropriate to spend this much amount of money on some ridiculous thing that they're proud of. It's when they mislead with that thing to then sell courses on how they made money. Mm -hmm. But then the realistic thing was they actually made the money selling the courses on the, you know, that sort of thing. I'm sure we could relate a lot about course selling people. Yeah. And it's like, oh, and it's a business expense because it fuels the growth of the business that teaches you how to make money. But it's really just about, I made money off of telling you how I made money, but it was actually just this. I love the, I love the the business of like, my business is telling people how to grow their business. It's like, well, what business do you start? The yeah. business of telling people how to grow their business. Yeah. It's wild how that's like an actual business model now is, you know, I'm going to get rich off of telling you how to get rich, but that's not even the thing I got rich with. I did okay, maybe with the stuff that's in the material, but it certainly is at best like one one hundredth of what's happening now. And yeah. rather, it's my three thousand dollar masterclass. Uh, yeah, that'll be a whole. Yeah, if we wanted to have an, an hour extended version of this podcast. It would be discussing yeah gu- financial guru or not not financial gurus, but the course gurus coaching yeah. world. I have like just my different opinions on it with, with everything. I think it's like I get it, yeah. I understand it. I can respect parts of it, of like certain angles, but there's a lot that I, I wouldn't even say disagree with, but it's just like, I wouldn't do because of my, like, I don't want to say morality, but just my outlook on like life and people's perception of, you know, how they get to be somewhere. Yeah. Kind of rubs me the wrong way sometimes. What do you think about people flexing their shit? Like if you see, look at my Bugatti. Well, (laughs) you fucking dork. I think, um, I don't know. Sometimes I I'm like, damn, dude, I need to go buy a lot of shit. So people know that I'm successful. Cause you know, p- sometimes people just associate like, like oh, Max's views are going down, dude. He's probably shit in the bed on like worrying about finances. I'm like, no, like I'm not. 
and it's like, you know, I need to like show people that I'm successful, yeah. like it can be a thought in my head, but I'm like, I don't really care. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess sometimes I worry about their financial decisions, but I'm assuming if people are buying Lambos, uh, I guess jewelry, maybe iced out, whatever, you know, expensive shit, yeah. you know, 10 plus thousand dollar accessories on their body or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of cars. Um, I just think of like, I'm assuming that they have their finances all in order. And I'm sure if they're buying a $200,000 car, they better have over a million free cash in the bank. Not yeah. like 500,000. I bought a $250,000 Lambo. I guess it's just different strokes, but I guess I, I'm more of like, I'm like, how is that? I see how it's, it's more inspirational, but I'm like, I'd rather, I don't fucking know, bro. Like what inspires you when you see like businesses and stuff or people who are successful, how do I, you get fired up? I think seeing stuff like Christian create like legacy mm -hmm. and creating um, just monumental things. I don't like, I don't really uh, get, get fired up from, I don't get fueled to be more successful by people showing how much money they spend or have, or, you know, what they can buy. Um, I think having the impact and like the, the, the reach to be able to like leave a, leave a mark on this world. And I, I, I always use Christian as an example because as one of my longtime best friends and just someone who's dominated in the space, like you see the level of impact he's had on the space. You see the level of uh, lives he've, ch he's changed. That to me is more uh, monumental, I think, than just how much someone can buy. All right. Yeah. I feel a similar way for sure. What's your thought? What's your thoughts on people spending a lot of money on stuff? Um, I think it's often just comes from a place of similar to what we just spoke about, like wanting to show like realistically, there's no utility to a Lambo at the end of the day. Like it's not even, it's not. you have to be super careful about speed bumps. You have to be super careful about little chunks taken out of the road. You can't even enjoy it sometimes depending on the road conditions. You know, there's not really a whole lot about it that is practical. It's very much either a token of you feel like you've succeeded in some way or it was like a childhood dream. So you've achieved it and it makes you gives you like a sense of reward or you're trying to flex on people or whatever. Like, I think oftentimes it is uh, not worthwhile to be going over the top in that area. And I don't know, it's miscalculated because people can just reinvest in themselves and they'll typically get a way better ROI out of it down the line. Like, I'm sure you probably invest most of your stuff back into yourself, right? Yeah. And the stock market, if I try to lose money, you know, if I'm, if I'm really wanting to lose money, I put it in crypto and stuff. How's your portfolio looking right now? <laughs> Fucking, I, I could buy a Lamborghini with my current losses at the moment, Yeah, <laughs> but you're like, just hold, hold and strong <laughs> Yeah, six years from now or 10 years from now. I'll thank myself. I keep telling myself that past year. I'm like, okay, yeah. seven years from now I'm going to thank myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's interesting. Um, and I, I, I guess the last kind of thing I'll say on this is when I look at people who are on YouTube, who are doing, let's say these like over the top challenges, I kind of relate to the same thing. I'm always like, they always need to one up themselves, one up the video of this ridiculous thing. And sometimes I think if people live this like flashy lifestyle of like, you know, uh, look how successful I am. They need to like, you start burning money even faster. Cause once you have the Lambos and bunch of iced out wrists, like what do you buy next to continue to, you know, cause someone else is going to have two Lambos. What do you got to buy now? And I got to get a yeah, Bugatti. The wild thing at scale is like, again, similar to the, the money, the hedonic treadmill of views at scale. When you have guys like, I don't know, Jesse James West million views, a video now very much wouldn't even want to do a video. If it got less than that, I imagine mm -hmm. at this point, Mr. Beast has to do like the most extraordinarily absurd things at this point to top the next one. There's like this impending, like where do you, where, what three years does that look like? Like or, you're, or everyone's going to be like, man, you've really lowered the quality of your content. Yeah. You only spent $2 million this video. I know like what the fuck you knew. I, I guess here's, this is take it with a grain of salt, but like what's more inspiring than like owning a Ferrari would be the guy who invented Ferrari. Like mm. the person who owns Ferrari, yeah. like that's like, I'm like, I would, I'd rather I'm inspired by people who built the things that like people want. Like yeah. that, that like are fueling the people who are buying all this shit. Are there any brands you look up to in your space specifically as like they set the standard of like, I want to be that one day? Like how big do you want Sour Strips to get? Like obviously it's as big as it can get, but like. 
I kind of keep my head down. Um, I, I don't know if like, I'm not, I don't think my goal with like sour strips is to build a, a candy conglomerate. Mm-hmm. Like I don't. You want to get acquired one day by a big. It, it's not necessarily that. I, I'd, I've I've made the the conversation about like um, I'm open to the conversation of being uh, accelerating my growth at an even faster rate uh, because of outside resources, not necessarily just capital, but whether it be manufacturing capabilities, distribution at scale that I couldn't. That would take me ten years to do on my own. Could I do it with the resources of a large company in three to five years mm-hmm. and be one of the top brands? You know, that's more like where I'm uh, entertaining that thought. But um, you know, do I want to create a do I want to create a candy plant and you know yeah. do all that? I, I don't know. I don't. I'm just I just kind of take it one day at a time and I just keep my my head down. And w- with Gorilla Mode, mine. Fuck, see, dude, I'm yeah. God damn it. I even wrote it. I like circle of gorilla mind. Um, what's kind of next f- for that? I know you started with the nootropics, nootropics and extended in the pre-workout and uh, sleep aid and stuff like that. And the, the brand has grown crazy. I see it all over all social media. Um, and uh, are you all going to, you going to get into energy drinks, protein bars? Yeah. Yeah. Probably going to expand to pretty much everything. Like I think energy drink space is getting a lot more saturated, but I think there is, I feel like when we came into the pre-workout space, it was also saturated. There's always, yeah. And I think we still changed the trajectory of what is perceived to be a like stack pre-workout or a high quality one when we entered that space. So I very much think we can do the same in the energy drink space. Although I am very much not looking forward to the retail side of things and the, uh, uh, the, the margins are so pitiful on energy drinks too, from what I've seen as well, which is yeah. like, it, it seems like something you have to scale absurdly significantly to actually get some sort of net profit yes. out of it. That is worthwhile. And, and you're in the refrigerated space, which is even more of a bitch than just getting like retail space. Yeah. And it's not something that is typically going to be, oh, I'm going to buy it from the Shopify store. It's typically going to be, is it at the grocery store or on Amazon prime or whatever? And that's an area that we're relatively new to. I believe energy drinks, uh, uh, I, I, could, I could be wrong, but like there's a reason why I think like Kevin O'Leary and Shark Tank has said that like, like no drink company has really found success in DTC like drinks because just shipping it, the weight, the problems, the breaking, like yeah. there's a reason why, you know, people aren't getting cases and cases like Red Bull that crushes, doesn't crush it like on Amazon or online. I mean, they do their own thing, but like, it's like people want to buy it in the store and just, there are a lot of costs and scale and getting the distribution. But you know, where you said about, you know, that the saturated market, I think if anyone never entered, enter the space because it was too saturated, you know, I think that's not like a good, that's not a good reasoning of not to try to try to do something. Yeah. Like objectively looking at, candy conglomerates i'm sure yeah. it was quite intimidating on the surface like how could i even make a dent in this mm-hmm. you know like these are long-standing like at least with supplements or something you could see that there have been other influencers who've achieved some level of success or in clothing you've seen big brands come out of you know very very humble beginnings but in candy i have i can't think of anything other than smart suites essentially yeah, that, that's that's the direct the, that's the other company that I would directly compare us to, even though we're in separate, like, you know, they're in like the better for you type of thing and the candy alternative type of thing. But mm-hmm. that'd be a, a company that is like, you know, no one's really, they really innovated in the space. Yeah. Ours has been kind of like, you know, no, we innovated in the, the branding and the marketing and the utilizing social media at scale. Um, and now in retail, you know, the proven business model that we're in, you know, it's doing extremely well. But um, I think, I think you'll do great when you, you come out with uh, all the other related products that you're going to do. Do you all have protein? Yeah, we have protein powder. I'd like to get into things like bars, maybe cookies at some point. Just, just the whole umbrella. Yeah, like everything. why not, you know? Um, and it's stuff that I otherwise buy myself sometimes. So why would I not be choosing something that, you know, I would otherwise feel is a high quality product and buy myself and then offer it? Like that's just the natural progression I feel like of what's a business that I align with that like for you, you're obsessed with candy or like Love Chris, it. Christian would have the white monster in every video or whatever. And it was like, why would you not go into that? 
Yeah, uh, it just makes sense. Yeah, and people I think, are going to resonate with it the most because they know you're not lying to them too because it's very much something you would tell them to buy even if you weren't making money on it. Yeah. I it, think that's important too. It for, is. And, and people are always like going down the path of making, uh, getting into products that make sense for their audience. Yeah. You're the guy that scientifically dismantles products. And the fact that you had almost a million people watch a video on your own company dismantling your own thing, like, like you're the guy for that. Mm-hmm. Like the, 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 the amount of like carryover from, I respect everything this guy says about products, about uh, supplementation, nutrition. If he comes out with something, I'm going to get it because I trust him and it makes sense. It's not just like a, a cash grab. And you know, you with the, the Merrick health and, you know, uh, blood work and uh, science and everything that goes into whether it be like testosterone or just, uh, longevity in mm-hmm. life. Like it makes sense that you do these companies. Um, whereas I see a lot of people who maybe just make businesses. You're like, that is okay. Like, okay. what are the, what are the worst examples you've seen of businesses that made no sense? You don't have to name <laughs> names, no, I, but like categories or I, I would say there's a lot of influencers that I don't, I do not know personally that I've seen get into the physical product space that I'm just like, I can, I, I can tell that they are doing things just because someone presented them with an opportunity to uh, make money, you know? Like some of that. Well, I guess it's not physical product, but some of the NFT stuff was pretty rough to watch. Oh, oh, I didn't even know we're going to that level of stuff. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no. But yeah, it, was, it wasn't physical, but it was like, it was wild how many people just hopped on the bandwagon and they didn't even, like, I have no conception of why I sell this. Mm-hmm. Buy JPEG from me. You know, that is something, and you never offered a, an no. NFT or anything. Okay. It, I, I hold a, I hold pride to some level of like who I am as an influencer to know that I have never, I, I don't know if you were to use the word shill, but like try to make quick money fast of things that I don't know about or agree about. Yeah. And like, I, I hold pride that I never, I saw people making money with NFTs. I had so many companies reach out to me about sour strips and making NFTs. It would make sense. Like their characters, you could make little NFT things, but I was like, Fuck no, absolutely not. And I'm like glad that I never did it, especially with the downfall, but of just like, I could never go to sleep at night knowing that I'm potentially losing people money, yeah. one thing, or like promising, look, you can make success off this and then it crashes and burns. The thing that's very, very discouraging and is kind of wild to see is how many people you would think their recommendations would get diluted by them doing that stuff. But over and over, they hammer their audience with horse shit and they still end up coming out on top on something else that was actually a decent product offering. So, for example, Logan Paul, pretty good example. Mm-hmm. Or Jake Paul. They like Logan has, um, like, I guess, Prime. If it's marketed in an ethical way, it's like not a bad product. It's yeah. like a potassium rich drink that tastes good, has sucralose. And yeah, I've, you, tried, I've tried it. It's yeah, tastes you just, good. You sip on it, it's decent. But then, when you sell like an NFT of crypto zoo, where you like, he was drawing all the, sh- or like the Photoshop, they would sh- get Shutterstock images yeah. and just fucking fuse them together. And it was the them. panda with elephant ears. Wasn't there an elephant trunk? That was like the big one people used. Yeah. To take two. Yeah. It's like, Oh, we're going to revolutionize the industry. Like this is the fucking shit. And then where is it now? <laughs> They're you like, know? Oh, that, no, th- I don't worry about that. Don't worry about yeah. that. Yeah. But it, it's wild. How, they get no heat for it and it doesn't dilute doesn't seem maybe they just have such a massive scale and audience hitting a small hit it doesn't matter yeah seemingly i don't know but it's like you've seen tons of these big creators seemingly sell out and it's it's wild because i feel like what you just said you would never want to do that because why would you ever a you don't feel it's ethical b you're risking the long-term accrual of your reputation over years and years to get a short-term gain it makes no logical sense, even from a business perspective. Yeah. But for them, even at the massive scale they've achieved and all their success, they're still willing to put it on the line for a one-time payment. I, I get, I don't, you know, we, we all know these kind of people as uh, like, we don't know them directly. I've never had a conversation. Sometimes I'm wondering, I'm like, like, what's the reasoning behind it? And sometimes I'm like, maybe my ethics is holding me back from going to n- the next level financially. Yeah. That maybe I shouldn't give a fuck, but like, I just can't get around that perfect example is like, I get people all the time that attack me for like, you know, I put out super high quality videos and always increase the production value, always trying to like be like a nice guy, but like people get so angry, whether it be like a 
clickbait title or something. I'm like, guys, this is just to, this is what YouTube, like the video is just as high quality. It's just like, I just pulled some random thumbnail title, but I'm like, I'm not trying to shill shit. I've never tried to sell you guys NFT established titles reached out to me. I, I turned them down because I don't agree with it. I've never tried to like sell you on some random fucking mobile game. That's stupid that I don't fucking use. Like, yeah. and I'm like, and you're getting mad at me about this. I was like, yeah. I'm the good guy. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, all these other people ripping you guys off and fucking taking your money on NFTs. Yeah. Let me have my title, dude. The wild thing is I've been reached out to by those mobile game companies too. And it's like, <laughs> I know I would never play it. And in the literal content of the email, it's like, yeah, we're that annoying game that's in your face all the time. <laughs> it's like, they know they're fucking annoying. Yeah. But it's like, we'll pay you so much to talk about it that you compromise the, like, maybe it's not unethical if you actually thought it was a good game or you played it or you thought people enjoyed it in your audience and you were, I don't know, like a, you had a demographic that was younger or something, but when you know it's just like a total fucking cash grab, I'm not saying that game sucks or anything. I'm just using it as an I example. I get nothing but those ads on my Instagram every day, all day. And I watch yeah. them because I'm like, oh, the game. Oh. And then I go look at it. I'm like, that doesn't look like anything like the game. I imagine this also plays into why you're probably successful, even what you perceive to be not the scale at which maybe like a hyper successful YouTuber is. Like I bet you're, ad slots or integrations are very, very high converting because people actually trust your recommendation and resonate with what you're saying versus I can't stand when I see people just sit there and mindlessly read off a script of today's sponsor is blah, blah, blah. This is the best thing because of this. Dude, you, you know, what's crazy is I, so we've had one sponsorship on this podcast for yeah. some reason, no one wants to sponsor the podcast, even though they're doing really well. They're doing better on my fucking YouTube. But uh, one of them was like Blue Mind, which I use the product every day and I mm. did my read and, you know, whatever. But when I see other podcasts, I guess it, it, maybe that's the standard, but I didn't know in podcast world, they're literally like, today's video is sponsored by SeatGeek. SeatGeek yeah. is the company and they're like legitimate, like reading it or like, this is the the game or the whatever. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, if, if companies react to me, I was like, I would never just, I would remember what I need to say, do it in clips, like put enthusiasm. Like they're, they don't even look up. If I paid I, like depends on the size of the channel, but sometimes it's in the tens of thousands of dollars of range for these sponsorships. If I paid that and then some guy was like sponsor time, this is sponsored by blah, blah. It's crazy. This is a, yeah. I, I just, I'm, I'm like, are these converting? I know, <laughs> but it must because they get New, they get the same sponsor sometimes multiple times. I know it's just like the brand exposure. Is that worth it? I just, it's mind blowing to me that that works. <laughs> Someone was like, wow, dude, that ad read where you didn't look up for the past minute and a half and read it. I'm going to go check that company out. Yeah. And like, I, as, as much as I've seen big creators at scale convert nothing, like I can't conceive in my head that that ad read equated to an ROI that was even breaking even, even in extrapolated exposure. I can't even imagine it would have been justified, but what do I know? I guess. Uh, what's your thoughts on how you, you you've used it a couple of times of like, you know, an audience doesn't mean you're going to convert well. Yeah. W what is uh? What have you seen from? I have ten million followers. Like I maybe they're trying to get sponsored by you, and they're like, oh, I'm going to convert so much. I want this. I, I need thirty thousand dollars a month as my salary because I have so many followers. I've had to deflate some egos, and I'm like pretty blunt about it to a point where some here's your sales. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I, I think I come across as a dick because I, I have a code myself that I used to track my own sales as if I'm an athlete. So I know what I am performing. Like if I was to be comparing my performance to these, to everyone else. So if they're like, this is what I want, I want to raise this, or this is what I'm worth, or you should hire me or, you know, get me on the team. And this is what I expect because this is what I'm worth because of my following or look at my engagement or whatever, it's pretty easy for me to actually break down, especially if they're an existing athlete and just look at the code and be like, Hey dude, like, this is what you're actually doing. And this is what like my code is doing, or this is what our top five is doing compared to you. And you have this more followers than them and more engagement. And yet you suck ass. Like what's the deal? They're probably like, no, that can't crunch the numbers yeah. again. <laughs> you're like crunch. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's like, it's very much is just an analytical thing whereby you can't argue against you're either converting or you're not. So that's the benefit of being the front facing person of your company too, because I think a lot of these business owners have no idea what is actually good or bad because they have no idea what a highly converting influencer really is. So their perception of it is, oh, this is probably good, but they have no idea if you actually resonated with your audience, hit hard, everything was 
like super, super on point. This is what, you know, Max would convert for your sour strips versus, you know, fill in the blank influencer. You would have no conception of what is actually good. Yeah. So maybe your baseline expectation is, okay, well, maybe that maybe they are worth that much. And sometimes you do have to waste a lot of money figuring out what that is. But fortunately for me, I have so much historical data on myself. I can be like, okay, in the supplement space, especially, I know where I stand as far as my code conversions. And obviously I'm, you know, it's a little bit inflated significantly because I'm the one who made the product, talked about it for years, et cetera. But at the end of the day, I'm still just a person who makes videos just like this other person. And if I'm able to achieve, you know, literally a hundred X the sales on the exact same product we're talking about, you know, something is not up to snuff where you're trying to ask for thousands and thousands of dollars potentially that is like completely unjustified. Have you ever had just someone like over in like in the millions of followers, just absolutely convert nothing like maybe not zero, but proportionally shit the bed. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's, but that's a big reason why when we have large influencers or whatever, uh, try to be like, Hey, I want to like, I want to work with sour strips. I want to promote, like, here's my rate. And I'm like, Hey, you know, Hey, we don't offer, you know, it's just, you can, you want the candy or you don't like, you know, because I've learned it doesn't convert. We have, we've sent little Yachty multiple times. Yeah. And he, and last time he tagged us on his story and whenever these huge, I mean, he's, you know, big, big name and you have, we've had top of the top influencers in the beauty space, whatever tag us, you know, you would think that either our social is going to grow in the thousands or at least move, or you're going to see a spike in sales. Nothing. Yeah. Little Yachty can tag us in a story. Nothing wrong. With little Yachty can tag us. Our followers do not move in the, it was, it goes from, it doesn't go from two or three to anything. Yeah. No spike in you wouldn't you would think nothing happened that day on sales, and that's where it gets into the conversation. That's a lot more complicated around what is the value of exposure, though. Because yes, I've had this conversation with Gary, who's the owner of Young LA, many times because we um, are pretty aligned and we have a lot of the same athletes. You know, we you know talk analytics all the time. As far as you know, he gives me an idea of you know any struggles they're having or not, and kind of gives me advice that's relevant for my company and vice versa. Yeah. And very much so there is some value of exposure that's hard to quantify though because I, I it I agree. doesn't equate to oh this is the sales or the following that came from this but very much your eyes or just your how many times have you heard a brand name that then when you hear it the next time maybe you're more likely to convert and trying to allocate some value metric to it very difficult i don't know how to do it either yeah and and i wasn't saying like you know that's why we don't pay little yachty like no, of the, the exposure is what we're that's why i'm trying to flood the market with it yeah but i guess bringing it back to like influencers it's but objectively somebody the layman would think mm-hmm. you got a plug from this massive celebrity equals your business just blew up 10x correct and it just doesn't and i think that's a a, a shock to a lot of people who look how many likes i'm getting and look how much how many followers i have and they think because I have a lot of followers, I should be paid this much. And, you know, and, and that's the di- difference of growing your numbers on social media and growing a converting audience. If this is something, how you make your money. Right. Um, and it's a big ego check to people uh, who are big time influencers who can't convert and are like struggle. I wouldn't say struggling, but uh, they're just, they can't wrap their head around why companies aren't paying them 10 times you it's know what I make. It's interesting though, when those people will do bad and then they still think they're so good that it's your fault. Yeah. Like the company <laughs> sucks ass. Even, somehow other athletes or ambassadors are doing this much, but it's still something wrong with you guys, not me. Like, look, I'm how, not, look how many, do I just posted this picture? Look how many likes I got. Yeah. This it, likes do not, con, let me repeat this. Likes do not convert to sales. Yeah. Period. And a lot of people, you get this, these vanity metrics and like you, you think success is a, f- a following, how many people are liking your selfie, how many people are yeah. watching your Instagram stories. No, I've been wild. I've been shocked sometimes by people I predicted. Like I'm getting better at predicting it now, obviously, as you have historical yeah. data. But, you know, back in the day, sometimes I'd think something would pop off, do shit. And then I would also think this thing would do poorly. One of our best things. And it's it's just wild. And as you start to accrue more data, you get better at predicting these outcomes and whatnot, but it's totally contrary to what a lot of logical conclusions you would come to as just on the surface, like this probably, okay, if this person has this many, many views and they plug hard and they say like with integrity, even people who come across as highly ethical people sometimes just don't move the needle too, even though it seems like they resonate with the product. 
and it'll be like, okay, maybe 1% of people move, which is like a way too high of number to expect 1%. I don't know why people throw that around. Even if only 1% of yeah. my audience converted, I would give you this many sales. Yeah. Like good fucking luck converting 1%. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, that, uh, oftentimes you think of that and then if you're lucky, it might be like one one thousandth of like one percent, if even, and then you're you're just shocked at the outcome, and it's not what you expected whatsoever. Uh, well, and a lot of people also think that just because they have an audience, they can sell anything, and it you find out what um, works best for your audience. I've had ad reads that I've done where I'm like very organic, authentic. It's a good product or service. I deliver it in a natural way in my videos, and then they're back and they're like, and it's not common because I have a lot of reoccurring sponsorships. But there's some that I've maybe done one with, and they're like, hey, it didn't do too well. Can you like? plug us like again. I'm like, I was like, look, I was like, I don't, it just didn't resonate with my do audience. You guarantee a certain amount of views or something. I've done view guarantees, which I don't uh, like, but I never, it, I'm like, I'm going to deliver it in the best way I can organically, that's what I do, yeah. naturally authentic. And I was like, I can't guarantee conversions. I can't guarantee sales. If it performs or it doesn't, I was like, to promise how the algorithm does is that's the most a, annoying. I've, yeah. I've stopped doing that before. It'd be like, we'll give you this rate of it, but you have to hit like a hundred thousand views, but you yeah. really only need to hit 10% of that. So you really need to yeah, hit and if a video gets throttled. It's like, it's not your fault necessarily. Sometimes yeah. you have a banger video that just the shitty for no reason. Yeah. Like, but, like last year, for example, and I guess maybe this is just the nature of, because it's my second time but, and not the first, but last year I posted a promo clip going on the Joe Rogan podcast. And obviously it was my first time on super amazing experience. Everyone's happy for me. The video hits trending of me in the, in the podcast room. And like, you have a sponsor in that video? No, oh, of course oh. not. <laughs> You're like, fuck. But, but it's like the, the algorithm at that time deemed me in Joe Rogan studio as like push this shit hard. And it was the first time I'd ever hit trending. And then the other day I post almost the same video in the same studio, doing a very similar thing, a bite sized clip does fractionally as well, like one tenth of the performance. And it's like, well, is that a nature of the organic push initially? Cause people have seen me there once. It's not as mind blowing of a thing as it was the first time. Or is it that the algorithm somehow knows I've done a video like that before? And it's like, oh, we're not going to feed you. Isn't that. it interesting how we talk about the algorithm? Like it's this some like <laughs> sentient being yeah. that you're like, we don't want to anger the algorithm. Yeah. Like oh, yeah. the algorithm did not like this video. Yeah. I'm sorry, algorithm. Exactly. It's like no one even knows what the fuck it is. Like it's like this thing that no one can describe. <laughs> like Yeah, it's wild. The uh, <laughs> amount of speculation and just like hyper analytical stuff you do around what appeases the algorithm and what it will like. Yeah, yeah. I, I've never been on the training page. It's one of my long term goals. I don't know if I'm ever achieve it. I don't, I don't think it's life changing if I, if I do. No, it's, but it, it's I've looked into it and it seems like you get you get a bit of a boost and it's nice to just take a screenshot and mm -hmm. have it. You know, you can you remember you were there. It's not like I've ever even referenced the picture since I took it. But yeah, I took a screenshot of whatever the highest spot I got was. Um, what was it? I think it was like six or something. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, now it, was, just, it was like the general trending, not like a category too, which was Yeah, sick. no, that's sick. And now yeah. it's just every time I'm, I, I go to the trending page and I'm just like, all right, which four Mr. Beast video are going to be yeah. up there? I was like, is yeah. it trending or is it just, he just gets like, is yeah. it trending anymore if he's just a top creator? I'm like, yeah, it's and, just, but he's, I actually talked to him on the phone and he's done like a pretty intensive he was a smart guy analysis of like what it actually gives you being trending versus not. I and think, it's, it's not as significant as you might think. Cause like, even when I go on YouTube, do you ever go to the general trending page to see other than for research? I just, I just go to see what cool videos are there. Oh, I you actually go there. Oh yeah. I never go there. Oh, I don't do it for research. I literally go to oh, see okay. like what crazy shit has happened. And it's usually like music videos, Mr. Beast. And then you see a video that has like 100,000 views as like the mm. fourth trending. And you're like, I don't understand. Like, why is yeah, this on the trend? Like a new iPhone review or something. Mr. Beast definitely is friends with the algorithm. He knows him personally. <laughs> <laughs> he like hangs. It's like the wizard of Oz. He knows like the, yeah. the algorithm behind the, the sheet, the sheet. Um, I know we're getting kind of long here. I, I, I do have one quick little thing I want to uh, talk about it. How do you, how did you get friends with Joe Rogan? Oh, he uh, watched my stuff and just reached out to me over at DM. Oh, yeah. yeah. When you got that DM where you're like, what? Oh yeah. <laughs> It like, was, it oh was, shit, stop what I'm doing. Hold on. It was wild though, because at the time there was huge travel restrictions because it was, he reached out to me in January of 2021. Where were you when you got the DM? I just woke up and <laughs> came out of my bedroom and saw, holy fuck. And like, I need to sit down and then you sit down to open this. And when you look at your notifications, it's like Joe Rogan started following you. You're like, <laughs> holy shit. So, so anyway, uh, you know, super flattering and immediately you're, you know, you're, 
if you're invited on, you would think go fuck in there now and take advantage. But there was travel restrictions and a lot of shit going on that was making it far more problematic. So I had to wait until the end of the year. So it was almost a year later I went on for the first time. Is he a cool guy? He seems like a yeah, cool guy. Yeah, he's exactly the same as he is in the podcast. Super chill. Prime example, he's obviously crushing it, doing extremely well. Number one, you know, podcast. I don't, his studio is also the, it's not the highest quality production I would say this is like <laughs> objectively <laughs> as impressive or more so like to be honest. But again, that's like, it like fits the vibe of if he went into some like Uber high production where there's like, is yeah, there, how, the, how many people are behind the well, scenes? Uh, there's Jamie behind the, a desk on the left-hand side that's doing the pulling up stuff. So there's not to, 20 people. That, no, oh. which it, it's way better like that. Yes. Cause I always wondered about people who have a big production crew with them. I'm like, do you lose some of the, you know, real, I don't know, comfort factor or ability to create organic, good conversation. Cause it, it feels way more pressured professional. You see people in the background going, mm -hmm. yep. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And like, I can't even imagine as a guest, you would be able to, I don't know, be able to speak the way you would normally speak because you don't even feel like you're having a normal conversation with the guy. It's like some sort of, I don't know, like a TV yeah. interview or something. But, um, yeah, his, uh, his setup is very, uh, I don't know humble for what he is. He had like this thing when he first moved to Texas. I don't know if you saw it. It was like this big red spaceship type. Oh no. Yeah. He changed it to be more. Every time I watch this podcast, I'm just like, it's so dark and I'm gonna get some more lights or something. I'm like, I mean, it works, but I'm like, yeah, my video quality, when I take the selfie video, everyone's always like, what do you have a fucking potato <laughs> phone? Cause it, the quality is so poor, but the lighting is yeah. terrible in there. But it's, it's, it's strategery. It's strategy. Yeah. Well, it's terrible for selfie videos, but I guess it's perfect for whatever he's doing, obviously. It seems to be working well for him. Did no. you notice any sort of like when that episode aired? I mean, I, you probably were stoked when that happened. Like, were, did was it a growth? Of all of the podcasts I've done, I actually haven't done that many, but of anything I've done collaborative wise, last year when I did his podcast was the first time I saw a very, very apparent spike. But it, again, Similar to what you said with, oh, if, you know, Lil Yachty talks about us, we expect this. The expectation is your channel or whatever it is that is being promoted explodes now and is like what took you from, you know, mediocrity mm -hmm. to fucking hero status. And it's not like that. Like, I think I might have gained, I don't know, five to 10,000 subs or something on Instagram, same kind of thing. And then it sort of peters out from there. So it's like significant of a spike for sure, but it's not like a lot of people would think. You do it, and now, even if you're an unknown influencer or something, now you are massive. And it's like, this is why. It's not necessarily the case. But it definitely, I think, circling back to the exposure thing, if you've been in front of certain people mm -hmm. on a certain platform, you have some level of credibility that then when they see you on YouTube or whatever, it's like, oh, that guy was on Joe Rogan. And down the line, maybe it equates to more yeah. conversion. So similar to the Lil Yachty thing, again, maybe Sour Strips. Oh, I saw that on you know, the celebrities page before, like, I'm going to try it now. For sure. Yeah. Versus like immediately, it's not going to convert just fucking everyone that watches it. But this time it was far more subtle than last time too. So there was definitely like a, cause you're I, not, you're, 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 you're episode two aired today. A few days ago, but it's yeah, it's up right now. Oh shit. I, okay. I saw the clips today. Yeah. Check it out. You guys haven't, you know. Dude. Well, I don't want to freak you out, but actually dude, you're going to get the most growth you've ever gotten ever from being on this podcast because <laughs> everyone that is, watches this is going to yeah. sub. You're going to see a spike, bro. You're going to be I'll like, be when's this one coming out? Uh, two Mondays from now. Holy shit. You go far ahead. Wow. Well, we, we always, we, I, tr we never like film and yeah. we try not to be film and upload that following Monday because he it literally gets, goes film next day. Oh, well we upload once a week. Okay. And, and luckily, and we have a very small team that, is, you know, doing, it's, it's actually just one guy. It's, it's a uh, Oz behind the camera there. Um, but I, I try, it stresses me out if I'm not two to three guests ahead, because then I'm like, I have so much other shit going on. Is that not problematic for touching on trending topics though? Cause you yes. Might, yes. Like I, I that's, even for clipping stuff too, if you're talking about like uh, the FTX debacle or something, but see my, this podcast is very, and I, I didn't have like a specific strategy when I started this podcast, but it's very different. Like we're not, it's not to the point yet. And I'm trying to like get, you know, big guests to grow it to the, be that point of, I've only had a couple of guests like, uh, you know, when my close circle of friends comes on, we can kind of like bullshit talk about really like, topics that are happening right now. Mm. But I guess it's, it's more of like a, 
about that person that's here. And then if we talk about something, but I didn't go the angle of like, oh, the liver king shit happened. I right. need to like yeah. put a video up like in a day about this. It's whether that's a good strategy or not, but no, that's well, not It's, my current it's definitely more sustainable if you are able to be successful without having to rely on the branding and, stuff. And yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And like what I'm hoping is people came for the guests that they love. They hopefully fall in love with me. And then no matter who I have on, they're just down for whatever conversations we have. You know, I had my buddy Joe who has his own social media and Joe knows best big giraffe guy, car guy. Mm -hmm. And it was like one of our top podcasts and he doesn't have a big social, but it's just because it was so just people chatting about random shit and he's coming on again and we're going to go even more casual oh, yeah. about it. So it's, I think people are starting to really like it and not need, you know, top tier guests or like, you know, big names every single week. It can just be repeated guests just shooting yeah. the shit. Yeah. For what it's worth though, I don't consume a lot of podcasts. Like I am very calculated about where I allocate my time to watch stuff. And I've watched full episodes of your podcast multiple times. So which one? The Guzman one, I've watched uh, The Ghost Guys, I've watched um, off the top of my head. Um, I don't know, I'd have to go through your catalog and I could tell He's you. He's watched two. Much. I've watched <laughs> that at least five, I think. But and the podcast is, is, you know, it's, uh, I like to have people on that I'm interested in. Sometimes I get hit up like, hey, I can get you this guest, but I'm like, if I don't know them like on any level and don't have interest in what, not like interest, but like I want people that I'm wanting to connect with. I had like the owner, one of the owners of Midday Squares on it didn't perform that great, but I was like, I wanted the, him on because I was very interested. I'm like, this will have value to people on some level. Um, so it's like, I don't know. I like to have people that I know. No, on yeah, here. I think you impart a lot of value too for people who are, especially in the entrepreneurial space. Like I watched, uh, I, I don't know if I finished the midday squares one, but I watched a decent chunk of it. If you're in like the CPG world, like it's, ex, but that was like all business. There was oh, the no alpha M one really good. Yeah. And it's it, hopefully it's like people come for one, and then they kind of trickle back and go watch the other ones because they're gonna be like, oh, maybe they're all this kind of vibe. Yeah, I'm gonna learn about this person even if I don't know them. But I'm trying to get out of like, I that people have to know who that person is in the thumbnail yeah. to watch it. Yeah. But I think this is gonna be one of the best videos, dude. Hope and so. I think it's one of the longest. Wait, what are we at, Oz? Two out longest episode. We need to end this shit, man. <laughs> oh, man. You, I felt like 10 minutes, man. No, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. What's next for you, bro? Um, I am going on the tiny meat gang podcast tomorrow and then I'm doing some other podcasts, tiny meat gang. Yeah. Cody Co. Noel Miller. Have you heard of them? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Big YouTuber got, they have a sick podcast studio. I've seen theirs. Yeah. It's like a spaceship. They're going into outer space for this one. Fuck. Yeah. I should have done. No, <laughs> actually I, so I don't, I've, I know who that is. I know who Cody Co. is. I'm not too familiar with this co-host that well, but I know who Cody Co. is. I've seen some of his content. But when I was looking up podcast, he has a sick podcast studio. Yeah. So that's, dope. that's, he looks, exp I thought this room was expensive. That <laughs> looks expensive. Yeah. I don't know what to expect, but uh should be fun. And I have a couple other ones planned, but after that, it's going to be, I don't know, nose to the grindstone again. And just uh, trying to get back to a regular cadence of content and just doing what I do. What would you say your percentage? I'm keep asking more questions here of, of, of your time. What percentage is social media, Derek, more plates, more dates content versus yeah. business. Like, are you like 50, 50, you split it. I mean, you have a business partner, so it helps, but, um, are you still like hyper-focused on more plates, more dates because it does fuel a lot of the things you do? Yeah. It's, uh, it kind of depends on the day. Cause sometimes I just, I'll do be, I'll be putting out fires all morning. And then before I know it, I, you're a firefighter. Yeah. In a business yeah. capacity. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm sure you can relate. You'll wake up and all of a sudden six minor things that yeah. didn't exist the night before you have to immediately address. Yeah. And then by the time you finish all that, it's like, oh, wow, it's uh, I'm starving. Time to eat. And then you eat. And then it's like, oh, you know, my mentally sharp hours are done now. And what can do I even feel like filming right now? And sometimes you just eat up a whole day on stuff that wasn't even on your to do list the day before. And that often happens to me as well. So then how do you watch TikTok? You know, you have no time to watch TikToks. Yeah, I got to start multitasking while I'm brushing my teeth. Tomorrow when you start brushing your teeth, just go on TikTok, dude. Yeah. You're like, exactly. this thing. The problem is after that, then you go lay in your bed and for another six hours and just keep like, oh my God, look at these dances. They're no, so fun. Nothing makes me feel stupider to just succumbing to the like brain chemistry of TikTok algorithm mm -hmm. dopamine hits. than when I realize I've spent 20 plus minutes going like, yeah, because I learned nothing from TikToks really. Like I just kind of, it's just fast, quick hit shit, dopamine hit, dopamine hit, and you're just mindlessly scrolling and 
Yeah, nothing makes me feel stupider than that app, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> How do you really feel? Yeah. No, that's cool, man. I, uh, it's it's cool to finally get to meet you in person, and I'm excited to see the growth of everything you're doing with all of your companies. I would say you should send me some of that myox- minoxidil, but I'm too afraid. I'll try it on my butt cheeks first, and then yeah. and then to make sure if hair grows there, you know. Got you, man. What could people put on their back to like? You could put. Oh, it I any- want to grow back hair. You could put it anywhere, bro, and it would grow hair. Seriously. The fuck. You want more pubes? Do you have to oh. like? I got. I got enough pubes. <laughs> you have to like strategically make sure. Like, what if you're like it gets like up here? And you're like fuck. Like, yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's the. It's wild because the beard thing too. It is permanent after you stop using it. Ugh. Yeah. So you would very much be committing to a more intensive shaving regimen if you. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna do it. Baby face max at 40 years old. Yeah. But dude, thank you so much for coming on here. I'm gonna put all of the the links to all your companies and your social media down in the description. So if anyone watching has not heard of Derek, make sure you go give him a follow, check out his brands and his businesses. And uh, that will wrap up episode 31 of the Don't Be Sour show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment, subscribe, hit the thumbs up. And if you're on any sort of podcast streaming service, give us a five-star review. It helps, I think. That'll be it. Thank you so much for, I already said, fuck it, fuck it. I always fuck up the outro, dude. I'm gonna say it again. Thank you so much for tuning in. Eat more sour strips and ever forward. Boom. That was pretty smooth for that much stuff to say in an outro. Yeah. I, I, I get a little tongue twister there, man. Yeah. Damn, two hour, over two hour episode. This is what the people want. Or should I have, I'm going to cut it up into four 30 minute episodes.